Mm, I don't really have any intro for this one. So uh, welcome. We are looking at, why don't I have anything up on the screen? I should at least have something up there. There. Um, we are uh, live. We're going to chat about the Tulsa gun show or the Wanamaker gun show. The largest gun show in the world has been going on for a long time. And it just happened. It happens twice a year. It just happened last weekend in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the um, uh, show was, uh, had not been, it didn't happen for the two times last year. So this is like the first time it's happened in a full year or almost a full year and uh, missed two seasons. I don't think it's ever, I don't think it's ever not happened before unless something came up with weather. I can't think of anything that I've read before that it, although I don't think I've ever seen anything say continually, but anyway, it's been going ongoing shows for a long time. And um, a lot of people go to the show, of course, but a lot of people we know from the uh, content creators community go to the show and some go to the show as a group uh, from the old gun channels days and go as like uh, media from the, with press passes from the promoters. So in other words, they work with conjunction, work with the promoters to uh, help promote the show. And uh, there's lots of people that did that and have done that this year. One of them that went through is 45 Alpha Charlie Papa on YouTube. And uh, you're joining me now. So you're joining us tonight. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah. Hello. How's it going? Good. And uh, yeah, so first off, thanks for uh, jumping on tonight, but thanks for going to the show, bringing a camera and then posting that because I think that's one of the coolest things is just genuine sharing of our community uh, with others uh, without a bunch of filters or extra, you know, special wrapping or anything. I mean, not that you don't do good production, but you're not, you're not Know, go in there with any extra intentions or you know intent to manipulate or anything you're just trying to share the show and right. i think that's good for the community and for the people that are looking at our community to just see honest uh sharing of it so anyway um thanks for jumping on and we're going to take a look at your instagram i guess uh this mm -hmm. is just one pick or is this a slideshow is oh there's just one pick okay uh but we've got your youtube video too so this is a Pretty good picture, though, to kind of represent a bunch of stuff in the show. We'll go back and look at that. And then uh, and I guess I can go ahead and throw a link to your Instagram out here. We are doing this live on YouTube. Uh, so anybody who's watching this live, you're welcome to leave us some comments and we'll address them here while we're chatting. Uh, if you're watching this in the future uh, as a recorded thing, then go ahead and leave comments. I'm going to link to uh, 45 Alpha's uh, YouTube channel and your or what do you go by 45 alpha or something else? Uh, Papa. Papa. So I'll leave a uh, link to your, ch your channel and uh, your Instagram so everybody can uh, check that out. Uh, but um, I'll shut up here for a second and then we'll launch your video. But just since you haven't had a chance to really say much, if you wanted to say anything before we launch the video. Um, oh, yeah. This this was my first time going to the show. Um, my dad and several others, I've, I've heard about the show for years. Um, so I... I knew what kind of what to expect, you know, the, that there was a lot of stuff there that if you actually, if there's something you'd like to acquire more than likely, it's going to be at that show and available to buy. Um, so, you know, this is my first time down. I was just trying to kind of get the lay of the land. I went down with a group of, uh, there were seven of us in a, in a van. So uh, made oh, it. I didn't even know about that aspect of it. So that's all that I want yeah, it, it was nice, you know, just a lot of camaraderie against amongst the guys and um, about a nine and a half hour drive down there. Oh, OK. Well, we got a lot of stuff. Let's get some of the uh, baseline stuff. So first off, what part of the country are you in? We're, I am in central Iowa. OK. And the show and well, that's first off, thanks for being online from Iowa. I yeah. always go around saying there's nobody in Iowa. And I remember uh, you had mentioned something in a chat one time and. And I remember there was somebody in Iowa, and now you remind me, I'll definitely remember, but not enough representation in the 2A community yeah. from Iowa. So thanks for doing that. But yeah, Honest Outlaw is here, but I, I've tried to get a hold of him, but I have never been able to touch base with him. Well, when you get these electric lines, in these wires, these metal ropes in between your homes, then you'll have connections <laughs> called to the there internet. There you go. <laughs> and then you'll be a lot easier. So, um, so uh, your what age group? I am 50. Okay, so then 
what about guns? Like you just got into guns last week or you've been into guns since you're a week old? Um, I grew up around them. I really got into them about uh, 2014. Oh, okay. Well, that's different. So I didn't know that. I don't know you. So, yep. uh, so you're not young, but you're not done yet. And you barely got into guns six years, uh, eight years ago. Let's see, yeah, about eight years ago. So 12, what did you say? 12 or 14? Sorry. 14. 14. So is that in reaction to something or? Uh, something? Yeah. The, the climate the, around uh, the political climate and stuff and stuff going on in the neighborhood. And um, I had okay. always been around them. Um, it was just kind of convincing the wife at, at some point. that. Uh, well, that's what people say, but convincing the wife means that you needed to go buy them. It would have already yep. been a done deal if you decided a long time ago. So it's something. So I guess I was alluding to it, but we're talking Obama's 23 executive actions, all the stuff that imp, imp, whatever created that situation and, and the tension and what. So that's the stuff that decided, yep. decided oh, I'm going to get into this. Yeah, so that then, was the one, kind of pushed me over the, the edge. But, you know, like now, I said, I've been around no guns around. at all. Like, I mean, being around guns is one thing. Some people I've talked to, especially older people that have been around guns forever. Um, I'll say they'll say, oh, I've been around guns forever. And I'll assume that means like they know people or they saw guns when they were a kid. And then it turns out, oh, no, I own six guns. It's just that I don't have a <laughs> lot of guns or anything. So, I mean, do you have a shotgun in the closet and you don't consider that a gun or? Like, no, I, I when I start when I started the channel right before I started the channel, I didn't have anything. Um, I had had okay. some stuff in the past. Uh, Dad worked for Brownells. Um, I shot high power um, in high school. I had a little mini fourteen that I was shooting high power with, and we got a uh, uh, an M1 Grand from that I never did shoot uh, from what was the CM what was the CMP at the time. Um, I think it was the real CMP from back yeah. in the day where it was goal was to get kids shooting and, uh, right guns into the hands of collectors. And when I got into uh, high school or not, when I got into college, um, that's about the time the uh, the assault weapons ban and stuff came out. And the prices on those guns skyrocketed. And I told dad, go ahead and sell them because I need the money. <laughs> and I was a college yeah. broke college kid at the time. So. Well, right on. So that tells us a lot, and I appreciate it because uh, I don't know. There's no way to know who is going to be listening to this potentially, or where they're coming from with guns or what. So that gives us some good insight. Right. And um, in fact, I yeah, I, I went it. to school with Pete Brownell. He was a great ahead of me. Interesting. So that is the guy that runs the place now. His dad is the Brownells yes. guy that invented some bluing. I think is originally what they uh, did. His or grandpa did. His grandpa. Yeah, it was his grandpa. Okay, so his grandpa was like, I think a handyman gunsmith type of thing, and then made some bluing and then started selling it locally, and then it turned into a mail order thing, and then yeah. made a bunch of money selling it mail order, and then the mail order turned into way more than just bluing, and now three generations later. So going to school with Brownells, was he, that would not have been now. Brownells was known by like 15 people in 1980s. Or yeah, like they would have been known by... Uh... Yeah. yeah, the gunsmiths and some of the gun shops and stuff. They were maybe the gun shops, and then yeah. they might go, "Oh, you're that guy," and then they wouldn't care at all because there was mm -hmm. no fame or fortune or no. Well, there's probably fortune, but there was no fame with the being in the Brownells. Although I don't, there must have been some money, but I don't think. Where uh, that's my question: Were they running around in like in the '80s? It would have been in a Lamborghini, or was it uh, just a normal guy? No, it was fairly normal. Yeah, they had the suburban, and uh, they were running around in the Monte Carlos. I mean, they had some nicer cars, but nothing but not flashy. Like, not like driving up in a, what is it, a, uh, having the um, limo driver drop off. Mm, no. Okay, so anyway, that was interesting. So um, you guys drove down from uh, I Iowa then. The other, you said you went down with nine dudes in a van. So this is a rental yeah, seven, van? Or there were seven, seven of us. An, a rental van or somebody awesome owns a van? And no, somebody awesome owns a van. He... Uh, he likes some uh, the multi passenger vans, and he's like, "I'm driving down there anyway," so he's just trying to fill seats. Yeah, that's awesome. Plus, a big van. What is it, Chevy or Dodge? Chevy. All right, so a decent, working, awesome van. You're going to have not just great gas mileage and a comfortable ride, right? But you're also going to have plenty of room when you come back from the show for all the stuff. And if there's not yeah. enough room, you got like 12 feet of storage up on top, so mm -hmm. you can basically strap half of the show drag it back with you in the van you should always think about getting a van they're better than regular cars but anyway so you guys go up in a van and nine people just without spending all afternoon 
they'd all been doing this forever or they were all similar or they're just first times? Hey, yeah, everybody that I went down with uh, had been there before. Lots of times, like, because this is the Several kind of thing times. that some people yeah. go for their whole lives and then other people like me have been going for a while and then. Um, the one guy and his wife, I mean, he goes every once in a while. Um, but the, the guy who has the van and his son and one of the other guys that I went with, they go down every time they get a chance. Every time the show's going on, they go down. Awesome. Um, what, my dad, he's been to most of them over the last few years. And he always catches a ride. They pick him up in Kansas City on the way down. So. See, this is what it's all about. I didn't know any of that. But that is what it's all about. That's the community part of it. You know, you hear the BS stuff online where there's usually some you know, idea in their head of what they're calling the community. But the community is the bigger picture of it all. Um, we have something similar in Arizona with the SAR show, a really big gun show that's been going on since 2000. And so it's only got a very short history, a 20 year history compared to the 1950s. I think this, the Tulsa show started and mm -hmm. certainly like the eighties or something. It's been going on in full force at the size it is now. So, you know, totally different, but out here, just in, I started going to SAR show in like 2000 and something two or four, and then really started going. I joined a club and we would have our yearly meeting at the SAR show. So I started going with gusto, let's say to the SAR show in like 2005 or six. And so I haven't seen the whole SAR show, but I've seen most of its rise and fall. But more importantly, in this case, the, the, the fact that people come from California, for sure, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, obviously Arizona, because it's held in Phoenix. But some people from like other states even that will reach out because it's the big show in right before it's the first weekend of December. So that particular show, you know draws a lot of people because of the region and it's the only other big show really each each part on this part of this uh, continent each mm -hmm. year but the tulsa show happens twice a year it's been going on since like the 50s and like i say full force i think since the 80s maybe even longer and my every i mean i liked guns my whole life and i got into guns in a whole different way online and then starting to go to the tulsa show just, I mean, even after I thought I could never be impressed with a gun again, I, the, the Tulsa show just, I mean, I'd been going to SHOT Show for years. So what was going to impress me about another gun show? Right. And then I just went to another level. And the reason is because it's not just huge, but the 16, well, there's what, 16,000 tables, I think. And I forget how many vendors, but the thousands of vendors are people like your friends, I guess, but on the other side of the table, but then there's so many people that attend the show and do what your friends are doing. And I've known people now after going to the show as a helping out people that run the show, um, like behind tables and stuff. Like I've seen people that like yourselves will all show up and rent a table and then all have st their own stuff to sell. And then they have people to watch the table while they walk around. It's a really good concept. So just I, and these, and I know people that live around there that have been going to the show their whole lives. So the, I don't know how to explain that more, but the community of it and the fact that, I don't know, it's like a race maybe or like a sports thing where people know that it's going to happen and they all show up and it's like basically equivalent of gun tailgating, right? Like everybody knows that's happening and some yeah. people are like, hell or high water, I'm going to be there. Other people are like, I know it's there consistently. So whenever I can and I have an ability, I'm going and everything in between. And then the people that go once, I guess, I guess it's possible to just go once. But uh, so that I appreciate you giving us a chance because the goal here is not to talk about um, well, is to talk about the show in as entirety as possible. So uh, not just like any one focus of it. So that's really neat that uh, nine people. Now, do you plan on going again? I'm assuming. Oh yeah, I plan on going again. Uh, very interesting show. I saw stuff there that I never see up here. Okay, so, so that one is another question. Before we get too much into the show, mm -hmm. you've been into guns now since 14 ish. Uh, how have you been about gun shows? Because gun shows is a whole different thing besides being a gun owner. Some people love gun shows. Some people hate gun shows. And there's, I guess, people that are indifferent. But where are you with gun shows and experience with gun shows? I love gun shows. I love hunting for the deal. I mean, I always hear about the people complaining about, oh, everything's just so high priced. And but you're just not looking. Um, there are, you know, fines and deals that can be found. And it, I, it's just the hunt sometimes for me to to find those those little hidden gems okay well i can't add much to that except that's awesome we should frame that but then how long you've been going to shows i mean have you just started going to shows in 14 or you've been going to shows longer than 
I just started going to shows around 14. Ah, okay. Well, I feel sorry for you because they're different. I mean, yeah, 14. There's a lot of good stuff. They, they, yeah, well, they took a really weird turn in 14. They'd happened in 2000. I've been going to gun shows my whole life, and I'm about the same age as you, so we're um, similar, but, you know, different, whatever. So I've been going to gun shows in a lot of places my whole life. I, I dig them a, a whole other level. I really like gun shows. They changed a lot in 2000 and never had been the same again. And I'm sure that they changed in other eras and I'm just not aware because I was too young or not paying attention. So I, but my awareness of them in 2000, they changed, they changed again drastically in 13. They changed a little bit in 2004 when the AWB ended and everybody could breathe normally and grab cool stuff and people started to manufacture and they got a little better, different, but better. And then in uh, 13 again, phew, really got weird. There was an ammo shortage right before and right around then. Oh yeah, so I got. I, I kind of got into right them right time. before that ammo shortage. So, so you kind of saw, you kind of had like a taste of like the concept where I I guess what I'm alluding to is yeah. like gun shows used to be like collectors areas and like a place to hang like a social kind of event, and then they got into a really weird commodity driven scarcity thing where you know people look at them as like some sort of weird market, like a farmer's market for guns or something, and and it gave gave them a real like street market vibe, and they became real weird. And the people that attended shows switched from the people that wanted to hang out, not even really talk politics as much as talk their passions, their collecting, or their you know their history, whatever it is, or maybe their shooting sports or their whatever it was. And you know the gun show gave them a place to basically do what we do on the internet before there was an internet. And that sort of ended and it became a bunch of desperate people because there was no reason for those people to show up anymore. There was an internet. So those people mm -hmm. could find the, the people that were really interested in the stuff they were really interested in. They didn't need to go to a gun show to seek them out. And there's hardly any gun shows that offer a lot of any specific thing anyway. So anyway, so the internet kind of killed that potentially anyway. But then when the scarcity of ammo happened, whoa, gun shows just got dumb. Everybody brought their old ammo in. Everybody vacuumed it up. And, and it just got weird. And the, so the people that attended gun shows came to be impressed and weren't and walked away offended for some reason. You know, and I don't know if that's, nobody planned it. It just happened. And gun show promoters weren't ready and didn't have a plan in mind. So they just reacted and they reacted to their peril and they've never come back from it. And now we're about to see something weird happen again. So that is an element to it. So I appreciate it again that, uh, um, to give us some of that insight. So if you've been going to them since 14, do you go regularly or just been to a gun show or two? No, I go no, regularly, regularly as, as, okay. often as, as often as I can. As now, so without me tainting it too much, I already did, I guess. What's your uh, opinion of shows? You said you liked them, which thank you, because I'm a big fan of them myself, obviously. But what's your opinion, if you can, remove Tulsa from it? Because that's obviously a, a game changer. But right, what, right. if we would have been talking like this before Tulsa, and I asked you this question, try to answer it that way. What do you, what's your opinion of gun shows? So they've been getting good, bad, are they getting better? They could be better. I love them. Uh, the, the smaller the ones smaller could ones be better. Are... The, um, we've got a, a, a larger one here. That's, you know, I think two to 300 tables. That's, that's decent. I mean, there's a nice little mix there, but, um, you know, the, the one I went on the first, um, they had that downtown, and that one was not worth uh, going to. It was, you know, $10 to get in, $10 to park. So I'm already $20 into it. And uh, with the you know, ammo shortage and everything else going on, you know, New Year's Day, it just was not an enjoyable show. But uh, other than that, I always had pretty good. Uh, uh, I've always liked going to uh, be around the, the same like-minded people, learn some stuff, maybe find a deal or two. You know, help out some of these smaller vendors and help out the, the show promoters. I mean, they're the ones putting in all the work to to um, put on these shows. So, you know, go to the show and, and support them. Right on, that gave me a chance to go through. I think I'm clicking on everybody that uh, is in the chat. Uh, and then he's last, I guess. But... Um, Thanks everybody for showing up. We'll go back and try to read questions here um, while we're watching the video or something, probably. But um, I appreciate all the like heads up or the pre the pre answering all the pre questions there because as we chat about the show, people have a better idea of you know your uh, 
position or, or point of view on it. Um, so anything else before we head into the show that you might want to uh, address before, I mean, before we watch your video? about? Uh, for... No, um, yeah, I just enjoy going to the shows. You know, this show was, was something different and something special. Okay, well, we'll watch the video and then I guess I'll ask you uh, some more Tulsa specific questions. Today is the day to get better fitting oh, dentures on. and feel safe. <laughs> I, every, <laughs> single, every time I watch a video now, it says dental thing. What do they know about my teeth? Mm -hmm. Every single time, I feel like I'm getting dentures. I don't even want Mine's been streaming. Hello, we're back. Over Charlie Papa Joe, and we are back from the Tulsa Wanamaker Gun Show. What an event! I would really recommend um, if you're into firearms, like I'm sure you are because you're watching the channel, um, if you ever get a chance to go to that show, it is huge. Um, I say I probably rock about two thirds of that show. Um, it's five acres right around there under one roof. Uh, and I was just focused on rifles. So I wasn't really looking at pistols and stuff. So it took me about seven hours to get about two thirds of that show looked at and by the time I was done at seven hours I was gut rich and cash poor. But we did get to uh, meet some of our fellow gun tubers out there. Uh, we met Clover Tack, Ghost Tactical, Roco, Izzard Gary, and Guns and Gear. So um, a great time was had. Those are great guys. Wish I could have spent a little bit more time with them but I went down as a group um, from up here, and we kind of stuck together with that plan. Uh, I wish I could spend more time at the show, but again, I was out of money by the time I left anyway. I wish I would have gotten a little bit more film and footage for you there. You go to my Instagram account, you can see some pictures, or you can go to the Facebook page and see some photos of some of the interesting things that I, I found at the show. But I thought I'd talk about the two deals I did get. Um, Prices were high, to be expected. Um, right now, you know, prices are high across the board in most places, and some people are really pricing high. Uh, there are guys out there who want pie in the high. Pie in the sky in the pie. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, they, they want really high prices for the stuff they have. Um, weren't very many ammo. Dang it, did I just do the whole thing without screen sharing? It's not like you were showing the show. It's you've been standing there the whole time. So you guys I've been sitting right. here looking at everything and y'all have been listening, I guess. But sorry about that. I think you started out nothing with just an intro. So you've been standing there the whole time. Uh yeah. sorry about that. Thanks, DJ, for mentioning that. I didn't even see until I looked this thing up. Yeah. Well, vendors there, there were a few, but ammo prices were again way up. Dollar for nine millimeter. I saw some boxes of 22 that were around $85. A couple of the other guys said they were seeing you know, boxes of 22 for $125. And the Remington buckets were like $300 for a bucket of Remington 22. So that gives you an idea where prices were that way. Um, but I like the challenge. I go to these shows and I like to try to find stuff that's still within the budget and affordable and cool and so, probably the buy of the show, right here. We've got an H&R in 223, break open action, single shot, with the scope for 1.75 Founding Fathers. That's right, 1.75 Founding Fathers. That's 25 less than a brick of small pistol primers or large pistol primers. 200 bucks. But nobody had any. So, you know, and the reloading guys weren't really there. I mean, there's some powder around, but uh, from what I understand, there's usually a lot more reloading guys there, too. And they, they just weren't there, but the house was packed. The house was full. Um, so, great deal here. Just to show that, yeah, you can find some really impressive deals. This one needs cleaned up a little bit. Looks like somebody may have left it in a gun case and it was a little, little wet. Um, but That'll clean up, and I think it's going to be a real good shooting. You'll see this later on on the channel. And then the piece de, de, piece de resistance. What we have here is an 1870s 
some on there. I'm still trying to do research on it. It's throwing me some curveballs. We will figure it out. Remington, rolling block in really, really good shape. Let's take this fluoroscope down the bore of this rifle. It's in pretty decent shape for being 150 years old. Still got some really good decent rifling going on in this board. We got, I'm almost positive it's probably going to be 43 Spanish. I think that's what this is rechambered to. Uh, we'll get it figured out. Jeez. Look at that ball. 150 year old rifle, guys. And that ball was just rich. Here's a pro tip. You've just given some criminal your exact ballistics information. Now all they got to do is <laughs> exactly replicate that bore, and now there they you can go. murder people <laughs> that caliber, and then you're going to get blamed. Uh-huh. They're pretty decent bore, huh? Really good buy. I mean, 500 founding fathers for, for this one. So, you know, it's not going to be a bad buy for Arlington Rolling Block. And the condition it's in, it's in really good condition. It's not all painted and rotted. Um, everything's there. We're going to have to cast the chamber, see what we got here. But just a really cool rolling block. Saw the uh, the old gunsmiths. But, uh, you'll see this more on the channel. We'll dig into it a little bit deeper. But just thought I'd bring it to you. The deals can be found at these shows even when prices are high. And size of that show you're bound to stumble into something at some point or another the old uh, gunsmith he picked up a couple he picked up a uh a wendell uh, it's an austrian very similar to the rolling block except for it rolls on the side it's more of a conversion from a black powder breech loading gun so he that will be on the channel and he uh, starts looking at that and playing with that and figures that out he also got a the winchester model 70 left-handed bolt in 22 to 50 uh, for 700 founding fathers. Actually, it was less than that. You talked them down from there. Um, sweet gun. That one is actually set up for competition. And I'm not talking just you know, your local competition. I'm talking almost Olympic style competition. Um, it's got the big, heavy stock on it. It's got a big, heavy, thick barrel. It weighs about 20 pounds. Um, it's got the aluminum milled insert in the bottom of the stock. Put the foregrip on so you can place your hand in the same spot at every time. Um, it's got a trigger on it that is just absolutely amazing. It's probably set at about 12 ounces, maybe. And it's got only about two millimeters of movement. In it. um, and it's just, just crisp. There's no take up. Just hit that trigger and boom, it goes. So. Really interesting rifle. We'll, we'll look at that one too. But I just thought I'd say, you know, came back from the Wanamaker Gun Show. It was a great time. I had a great time with the other gun tubers that were there. Um, maybe in the fall, I can spend some more time down there. Maybe hang out with them a little bit more. This 45 Alpha Charlie Papa Charlie. If you're ever down that way and you ever get to go to the Wanamaker Gun Show, I suggest you do it. I'm out. That's the That's end. it. So I'm over here, uh, over here on this page looking for uh, old pictures. So I typed in the hashtag Wanamaker Gun Show uh, into the Instagrams and looking back through old ones. Uh, Gun Lama Grandpa had asked, uh, has anybody ever taken a step counter to see how far? And I did, and I'm figuring I must have uh, posted it on the yeah, Instagram. Yeah. So. yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think um, uh, Gizzard Gary Gizzard was Gary was too. Oh, he did? Okay. So, um, 
Justin saying walked over six and a half miles Saturday and stood around all day on Sunday because that's a whole nother thing. Uh, standing on concrete all day, uh, you know, you're not like a prisoner or like a parade uh, rest or something. So um, you can move around or something, but that really abuses the, for me, it abuses the knees just standing all the time. Uh, so I just went all the way back. I typed in Wanamaker Gun Show uh, hashtag in there, and it looks like the first one is some kind of a cop's shirt from 2014. And that's some gun shop or something, I guess. Yeah, and I think our, our hashtag this year was a Tulsa Show 421. Yeah, I saw a couple of them where you guys were using like Tulsa 416. I don't know yeah. how that one. T Tulsa Show 421 was the hashtag. That one made sense because 21. Yeah, I saw it. Anyway, so this one is just plain old Wanamaker, which I don't know if we were using a special tag, but that was the problem is when you type in plain old Wanamaker, you get everything. Yeah. So this one starts in 2014. You can see there's just some like random stuff. Here's one that gives us a little view of the size of the building. So uh, the building is in Tulsa. We'll uh, open up a map here. And I guess now that we watch the video while I'm grabbing the map, um, anything you wanted to add after watching the video or anything that brought up uh, kind of thinking of the show or anything in general? No, you know, the, the interesting thing with that show is it runs a wide gambit of firearms. Um, everything from the modern stuff to uh, high-end collectibles and, and everything in between it you know around here i very rarely see any like double or double barrel side by sides uh, there were hundreds of them down there that i could have had it's something on my list to acquire at some point but it's just the the amount of stuff that's there you know we, m1 grands all over the place m1 carbines all over the place um sporterized uh, you know, if you're looking for a low-end uh, military-style rifle, a lot of sporter rifles there. A lot of higher-end, you know, untouched ones. It's just amazing the the amount of stuff that's there. It is a crazy variety compared to other gun shows. It's different, and you know, if there's let's say there's a hundred categories of things that could be at a gun show, Wanamaker has like seventy of them. It doesn't have everything, but it has a lot, and and the seventy that it has. You know, if there's a hundred things that can be at a gun show and, you know, they're all on a spectrum from left to right or from up and down or something, you know, and most gun shows are going to be some version of like 30 of those hundred or even 20 of those hundred, you know, most shows are kind of focused or they attract a certain type of person um, or to a certain type of shooter or somebody that's interested or collectors or whatever, right? Or you'll have that one collector guy at a show and, you know, that's the only guy that's selling that kind of stuff. Well, but most of the time, you know, I'm just saying like a show that's made for ammo collecting isn't going to attract a lot of um, sports shooters. And a, and a right. show that's made for competition shooters and tactical guys and and that isn't going to attract a lot of reloaders necessarily. But sometimes there's a little bit and there's always the extremes. But if you think of like a typical gun show, if it you know is barely going to hit 20 of the 100 things that could be at a gun show, Oklahoma or Tulsa will have like 70, like just more because it's bigger, but also because they take a bigger bite. They do a draw a different, like a more variety of person, but I don't want to say it's everything. So there's certainly things that are just void there. Like you're not going to find some things, which is fine. It's because you're not going to find some things ever. And some things, you know, there's a whole show specific to it for me, like collecting ammo. And it's annoying because it's a huge show, but as an ammo collector, there's very little, I'll find stuff. But yeah, it's there's almost stuff there. no one that's focused on it. I'll definitely find stuff, but it'll be by accident, which is for me funner because I honestly, I like it. I like hunting for it. But I'm just saying that just to give people an idea. It is a huge show, but it's not as though if there's 100 things, they have 99 of them because there is no show like that. It's a, it's still like got some scope to it. It's just that that scope is so much larger. And then in the scale of it is insane. Um, now, I've only been to, well, I haven't been to every kind of gun show. So the other big gun shows are in Florida and in Virginia, at least the ones that I haven't been to. So I haven't seen those flavors yet. But from being to the specific shows, like the collector show or the ammo shows or whatever, the very show, I've even been to shows that were just AK stuff. Um, Oklahoma does attract like a definitely a unique and then just so much more uh, people to it. Uh, okay, I'm zooming in to Oklahoma. So Oklahoma's a middle country. It looks like a frying pan. They think that's funny. You go over to Tulsa, which is a little tiny town over here. 
And the only thing really good about Tulsa is if you go up a little bit to a place called Claremore, and the largest firearms collection in the world was donated to the city or the state of Oklahoma by the dude that acquired that collection. And as long as they would buy it a building and then let people go to that collection for free forever. And Oklahoma stood by that word, that agreement, and that's the J.M. Davis Museum right there. That's the largest collection of firearms in the world by one person and then available. And it's been growing since then by donations from cops and stuff. And hopefully by me one day, I want to give some stuff to them. Anyway, that didn't is know that. the reason you have a in Tulsa. Huh? That's interesting. I, we stayed in Claremore. I'd like to see that next time we go down. Oh, yeah. That's the only reason to go to Oklahoma. And then it's the only reason to go to Tulsa or stop in Oklahoma. But they also have the world's largest gun show, and that's what we're talking about. So if you go to the rest of the town down here, so basically you go to the Jim Davis Museum, right? And then you drive down this yellow road. Most of the roads on Google are yellow. And then you drive down it, and you're eventually going to get to this place. You got to go past those weird bridges. And then you're going to go down here a little bit more. And you know you're getting close to the show when you get down to this weird blue whale in the middle of the lake right there. See, now, mm -hmm. you know, now I'm on the right track. I'm definitely heading to the uh, gun show. So now we're going to go down uh, to the town. It's easier on the map for me. A long way off. So we go back down to the town. And you look for some green stuff right in the middle of town. Oh, no, the yellow stuff right in the middle of town. So this is how, if this is Tulsa, which is pretty big. Tulsa, I judge those towns by how many gun, show, gun shops they have. Uh, so easy way to do that is let the internet do it. You go gun shop, tell it to search Tulsa for that. That's how many gun shops they've been to. I've been to most of them, not some, not all the outliers, um, but it's a pretty decent town. And... That's one way to judge how big the town is. They've also got some good shooting ranges. Uh, if we look at how big that town is, the state fairgrounds is kind of sub a piece of the town. Like it's not little. It's not like just one. It's huge, right? Like that's yeah. a big complex. So now we're going to go into that complex and this building ain't farting around. I'm in space, right? I'm on some like space thing looking at it and I can see that building. So we're in the rest of its parking lot to get people in that building. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to use modern tech, uh, and we're going to zoom around this building. And the reason that we always use this big yellow dude is because there's a big yellow dude hanging out in front of the building. It's like Magic Genie or something. He guards this contraption that he's holding on to, and he guards people from going into that building. And this building was, uh, it's all free, they call that, when it's open. We started this whole thing talking about it. You see there's not even one pillar in there because they're scared of pillars in Oklahoma. So they figured since there's no pillars in here, why don't we put oil rigs inside of it? So this was originally designed so that they could set up oil rigs. They were cracking all kinds of oil out of the ground and making it into fossil fuels or whatever. And they made this huge building, right? And then they were like, hey, let's make electric cars and get rid of fossil fuels and save the environment. So they're like, what are we going to do with this building? Just throw it away? And they're like, no, let's have the world's largest gun show in it. So that's what we're talking about. World's largest gun show. So for some reason, the earth bends and this building's too big. So right around here, there's a break in the building. Look, you can almost kind of see a line right there. So because of the curvature of the earth or whatever, they had to put a line in the building. And we're going to see that, I'm sure, on some of these pictures. But that gives you a scale of the place. One time, I had to park over here. So you know how big this thing is. I literally had to park over here, walk through all of this crap. This... These are weird buildings named after Fords. This is like the Ford Explorer building, and this is the Ford Caravan building, and this is like the Ford Suburban building and the Ford Mustang building. Mm -hmm. And there's always horses and things going on, like state fair related, uh, always, I think. And then, but when the show is in full force, boom, you're, you're, you're not even near this thing. So where did you guys park? How far away did you uh, park? You had park. Actually, because we were in the van, the, the driver of the van dropped us off on the uh, north side of the building, and he went and parked, so I have no idea where they parked. North side? This side of the building? Mm -hmm. How did you get in on the north side of the building? Uh, there was a door there. But you, they would take tickets on the north side? Yep. In this building, in this door? Yep. 
I've never actually been in that door. Okay, so I didn't know you could go in with tickets. That makes more sense. There's always a yeah. Ton back of they were they were going down the the aisle there and, and selling us tickets. So that as nice. soon as we got in the door, we can hand them the ticket and go in. This is kind of neat. I don't think I've ever looked at it from space from that angle. It definitely you can see how the curvature of the earth makes the building like taller over here or something. That's probably so that they could put their oil rigs in here on this side. Yeah. Anyway, and then so he. And when we were done, they'd already gone to the van. He just pulled the van up to the, the front door there, and I got in. So That's because van people are better than regular people. They care about other people more than other people, and that's the kind of advantage of having a van friend in your life. Mm -hmm. So one time, we had to park in this racetrack. They, I don't know what happened anymore. I think they ended up, like, you've got, like, everybody in the world goes here. So this whole thing is full of cars when it's an actual gun show. So I think there was literally just parking this whole thing. Like everything in here was filled with cars parked. And I forget the story anymore, but and the, the long story short is somebody was parked over here. We ended up driving over here and then we had a race on this. We thought we were just racing on a racetrack. It turns out, I think we were on a horse racetrack, oh, but it worked. And we had like a, I was in the cop car, I think. And we were racing, I, can't, I think it was in the cop car. We were racing somebody in the cop car. Somebody out here might know. That was a long time ago. Um, so that's the Tulsa Fairgrounds, and that's the building. And you said this is a five-acre building? Yeah, that's big... my understanding. It's five acres, but it could be bigger. I... Okay. Um, I, I don't remember either. I know that it's a lot. It, uh, Post was saying it took them nine-something uh, miles to walk it. Um, this is the main entrance normally. And then just to give us an idea, if we're looking at it, north is where it says Chili Bowl and south is this yellow bag garden. This is like, I think normally where people go in with tickets and because I've never actually gone in with tickets. I've always gone in ahead of time as somebody who's setting up a table and help or helping somebody set up a table. I guess I did one time have my own table there actually. Um, or I've always gone in with the gun channels folks and we get a table and that's what I was going to show everybody. Um, so there's this line in the center, and this is what we call the upper level, and the lower level is over here. There's bathrooms, I think, let's say, in kind of the, not quite the corners, but there's bathrooms, you know, around the edges of the building. And then we always get a table in this sort of area. It's It's been around this area somewhere. So if we rip the roof off, like a hurricane or a tornado would do, then you're going to see the guys with the safes here and the calendar girls and... I think who else is kind of semi-permanent. Uh, and then the bathrooms and then the, the food area. And this over here somewhere is the smoking door where all the people that are trying to grow lung cancers um, would uh, go outside and do that. And that's usually where we're at. And those are like sort of the waypoints that you'll get here and about the gun channels people um, conversations. So additional stuff is 2226 nut is a dude that lives here and has been going to the show his whole life since he was a little kid. He grew up here. I'm not going to say he was born in the gun show, but he was born and then they took him to the gun show. So his family's table is around over here somewhere. And the way it works is over here is the highest level of seniority. And then I don't know if it's like, the I think it might even be like this way and then over here somewhere. So the people in this area have been going to the show forever. And there's a definite feel or like a vibe to this area and you know it's more than just the stuff they have on their tables although there is sort of a different feel to this area of the show too i think but it's just this is the people that have been doing it for a long time and they're really chill it's not like they're snooty or anything it's just that just to give you some fyi and then i don't think there's much other seniority i know that you can't get upstairs until you've been downstairs for a while but then when I got a table myself one time, I was upstairs. So I don't know if that's a hard, fast rule or if it's more like they fill up the top first and then they start filling up the bottom. So if someone shows up late, they've got a tendency to be at the bottom. But you know, I, I really don't know. I've never actually talked to them about how they run it. That would be an amazing conversation, though, to talk to the people that have created the largest gun show in the world and then do it twice a year successfully. I mean, it's they, they, appear, they run a magazine. There's like a published magazine for the show, uh, all the different other stuff they need to have, the printing and the uh, stuff that needs to be made. Uh, the I can't even imagine. Obviously, they've got their communication and their abilities down, but, you know, they've got it honed. But uh, I can't even imagine the level of complexity, I guess, right, and 
stuff that has to go on and all the different elements involved, the town, the, mm -hmm. the FBI, or I guess the ATF, and you know just how many levels of BS do they got to deal with. Okay, so I guess we spent way too much time probably I talking about that. Yeah, you have to think about the complexity too last year when they canceled it twice. Yeah, and then dealing with uh, or whatever they did. Um, so I kind of went off on a tangent there, but that hopefully gives people that haven't that have no idea what we're talking about some scope. Now I'm not going to credit all these uh, because I don't know who they are, and I'm not going to look at every one of them. But I'm going to pick through some of these uh, only because when I looked at yours, we've got the one picture that you posted here. I think I can zoom in on it. We actually do get a lot. So, is there first off, is there a reason why you did the cannons? Uh, I just thought they were really interesting. That's something I see at the shows here. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I guess that's sort of uh, you have to have a cannon person around to see the cannons. Mm -hmm. um, now, do you know these people, or you just saw? It no, I just I asked them if it was okay to take the picture, and they said, "Yeah." Okay. So, um, yeah, cannons are kind of neat. These are larger, so these might be for like a golf course or something like that, or somebody that's in a club that has some sort of a ceremonial need for one of these things. Um, sometimes if they look a little different, they'll be for a boat. And again, for ceremony, I think they're for ceremonial or like when they leave a bay or something. I don't know if they do on a boat. But, yeah, um, sometimes start and finish for like sailboat races. and Yeah, like a, something like a organization might get them for something like that. But then you can just get them because they're awesome. And you can shoot stuff out of them. And they make ones this size would probably be like a golf ball or something. But yeah, certainly cannons. I've actually had pretty good luck. I keep an eye out for cannons because uh, you can pay more than you'd ever want for a cannon, I guess, if you wanted to. But I've also, well, I only will buy cannons that are basically free. So I have found so many cheap, inexpensive, awesome cannons. I'll do a video on my cannon collection. That is, that is awesome. So cannons are fun and you can buy them anywhere because they're nothing. They're just bunches of metal, heavy metal. Uh, they're almost always um, arc, uh, antique ignition, so they don't count as a gun anywhere, except for in the most restrictive states that you know consider muzzle loading a firearm. So they're not a big deal about buying them out of state, and they're just awesome, and they're fun to have to play with. Um, anyway, so um, no, like you're not a cannon collector. You don't got like you weren't planning on buying a cannon or nothing. No, but uh, it got the wheels turned into maybe make one or find one. That's the other thing is they're super fun as a DIY project. And it's, it takes on a whole nother level and the whole stupid 80%, you know, now that they're dragging 80% up is an issue. But I'm just looking at these and what makes a cannon interesting or expensive is how much attention you spend on the cannon. If it's either a piece of pipe or something fancy, how realistic or accurate it is. And then the thing it's on, I don't know what they call it, I guess a carriage or a chassis or whatever. So, you know, you make them realistic or you make them interesting or you make them useful or you make them, fixed to whatever it is anyway so that that you know so many things on a cannon they can go from junk to really expensive uh anyway so um oh i guess i was also gonna look at um, yeah it's a big big cinnamon roll at tully's this is everybody down here told me diner. yeah everybody yeah. told me you gotta have their cinnamon roll oh of course i closed the thing in half a second so if we looked at that map at tulsa and the the Fairgrounds was kind of a big yellow rectangle, almost at the edge of that rectangle. I mean, it's really only not even, a, you could walk there, right? It's not that far from the show. Right. That's probably one of the closest restaurants to the show. It might be a little far to walk after you walk the show. But um, anyway, yeah, it's like a 50s diner-ish. And yeah. they definitely seem like there's there's some sort of um, a destination, I think, on Route 66 or something. So they, they understand that they're going to get a lot of uh, customers' rushes. And they deal with it. I it didn't seem like they were struggling. If anything, they seem like they were a little bit too uh, capable of dealing yeah. with the Russians. Like yeah, they, they, they were, they were on the ball. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, like they just they were just like if you went into a really really good hospital, like don't expect them to care about you because they can't. They they are capable of dealing with a lot of people, and they do. They get mm -hmm. you in and out, and they're nice. But it just seemed a little bit. Um, anyway, it was a nice restaurant, and I didn't. I can't remember. The food was okay, I guess. Nobody complained about everybody like the other thing. Um, but the experience was fun. You don't see 50s diners very often that aren't really lame. And that one, I think, pulls it off pretty good. Like, they're 50s and they know it. And they're not, like, reminding you every 15 seconds. And they haven't forgotten it either. I think, mm. I don't know if that explains it well. But anyway, I thought that was a pretty good restaurant. And it's cool that it's become uh, sort of a tradition with uh, the group, too. Because uh, I think, well... 
I don't know all the times, but I know I've been to a, to a couple of times with people. Um, anyway, so that was one of the restaurants that we'll end up going to. And that's part of the whole thing with the community and stuff. If we were going golfing or sports or cars or guitars or hang gliding, we'd also be eating and stuff, right? That would all be part of it. Uh, so it's cool that we're doing that. We're going to these places. And obviously that place must make a ton of money off of the Tulsa show, right? Like they, they know that it's happening and they got, were they happy that they know you were coming and yeah, uh, they, they got us in and out. Um, um, they didn't, didn't seem too busy, but we left about three in the afternoon. So you know, they they had guys, quite a bit of people you, in. Did, did you hang out with the gun channels people, or what? I guess I'm not even paying attention. I, you yeah, I hung out with them a little me? bit. Yeah, but I. But when you say we, you're talking about the guys that came I'm down. Talking from the guys that came down with yeah the guy that the guy that had the van that I was riding in. No, those guys knew about that Tully's also. Oh yeah, see, so it's a thing for everybody. Um, Echo just showed up. Yeah, we have, we are chatting about the uh, Tulsa show. Um, probably chatting long, too long winded, but uh, just to talk about the largest gun show in the world, we're talking with uh, Forty Five Alpha Charlie Papa, and uh, he's a uh, longtime gun owner and active in guns since fourteen. So uh, been active in guns for a while now, and then going to gun shows for a while. Went to Tulsa for his first time uh, just last weekend, right? Yep. So just as a side note, would you ever, uh, everybody pitch in on gas for that or? No, he, uh, he provided the gas. He says he's driving down there anyway. He was just looking for people to go with. Right on. And then what did you do? Just went down there for the day and came back? Or yeah, went down, well, we came down Friday night, uh, stayed in the hotel, uh, went for set, went for the show for Saturday. So how uncomfortable is nine dudes in one bed? I mean, I can understand. <laughs> Yeah, no, we I, had several rooms. We had several rooms. I, me and my dad room together. Okay, I was thinking like three dudes one way, three dudes another way, and three <laughs> dudes the other way with the head to feet. No, no, we paid for the hotels and so they they just divided. We had uh, yeah, there were seven of us and we had three rooms. So. All right, so um, was it like any kind of strategy in the van on the way down? Like I'm looking for this, and if anybody finds this, then here's my text or something like that. A little bit. Uh, I know one of the guys was looking for a lightning or thunder, a Colt lightning or thunder. Yeah, see, everything so, about this concept of having a bunch of dudes in a van who are all going to a similar thing uh, to be on the lookout. And then that's like having, uh, what, 18 eyes helping you? Yeah. All cool. drive around different pla or walk around different places. Yeah, now I was looking see for a uh, busted up, broken down uh, Mosin the Gaunt because I've got a stock downstairs, but. Uh, Dad found one, but I ended up buying some other stuff. Is it Matt bought a Nagant Guts or somebody bought either a Nagant Guts or a SKS Guts for like 20 bucks or 30 bucks one year? Yeah. Um, I'm looking at this thing, and this is exactly the tool I need to pull the bathtub thing out of my bathtub drain. I need some kind of world, weird neural thing like this that bites on the outside, like the inside of the drain, but the outside of the tool. Mm hmm. I think this would be expensive and too narrow. But anyway, it looks exactly like that. The plumbing on the brain. So um, I'm looking through this some more just to see what else we can see. This one looks like it's from 2017. There's a picture from the ground of that giant robot that lives out front of the thing. Um, yeah, because we came in the back door, I didn't get to see him. Oh, really? You didn't even drive it around? You didn't get to see it? No, I from from we were reading the uh, the website and they said the the one street was going to be closed, so we came in on the back side. Well, it's probably good because if you do things wrong, he'll swing this giant axe at you. <laughs> so this is Oral's my old puppy back in the day. Um, they said, don't take pictures. And I said, screw you. I'm taking my dog out and taking pictures. Anyway. Yeah. But um, this was one of the years when I, this is the year probably that I had a table. And when you have a table, you can show up the day early and set up. And I just drove into the one end and uh, unloaded. But it was just neat to be able to drive my van into that giant building. Uh, this is another view of what it looks like from the inside, standing up and just probably standing up like, you know, on the van ish and then taking a look down. So this is the upper level kind of where you see it stop here isn't the end of the building. That's where it drops down and you don't see the other thing keep going. But you can definitely mm -hmm. see on the roof that it's all the same height of the roof and just a really, really nice place. I've been there in heat. I've been there in cold. And it's probably something about having all those bodies in there. Like it keeps a pretty decent temperature. I 
knock on wood, I haven't seen it got too cold or too hot yet. Uh, and too cold hasn't been a problem either. Uh, it's just some more pictures. That's puppy in front of the uh, robot out front. I guess this, does it have the date? No, uh, this would have been back in 17. Uh, let's see if we can find any more. Um, there's all of us there. This is, I just found this thing the other day. It's sitting out in my garden. Uh, this was a plastic square gun that somebody got and we were playing with it. <laughs> you know. Um, here's some more pictures. Oh, I guess that's just one. But that's the kind of stuff you'll see a lot is just uh, collectors or uh, that's not like a gun shop. That's what I was like a collector of these things, I think. And, mm -hmm. just, uh, bringing and I think that's why some of those prices were high. So I think some of those guys were collectors and you know they really didn't want to sell them. But if you wanted to meet that high price, I, I'd let it go. Well, and sometimes, you know, when I, I was listening to this, I think it was Roll Call. I don't know if he's still out here. He's going to get here. So I say this, but he was, I think it was him complaining about a, is this a mini Uzi? Two thirds scale replica in 25. Oh, I didn't know this thing existed. Who is this? Anybody know who this is? Uh -huh. This is, I'm really off topic here, but this is a, is a two thirds scale in 25 ACP. That is awesome. So I didn't even know they existed. They make a two thirds scale Uzi. That's in 25 ACP. I have a new <laughs> thing to look for in the world. So uh, that's cool. Anyway, Rokal was saying that an SKS was super expensive. And yeah, I mean, a run-of-the-mill cheap garbage SKS at a high price, I would agree with you. But if it's like a super rare non bring back, those have never dipped under $2,000. Right. At the time of $85 SKSs, those were $2,000. So, you know, you look at the wrong gun and think it's something else and you think it's a ripoff, but it's actually just the price it's always been. And I don't know which one he saw or whatever, but. You know, I, I kind of coined a new term after going to this show. Um, you know, you got your new guns, you got your used guns, you got your very well-worn patina guns, and then you've got more patina than I can afford. Um, yeah, there was just some stuff there that, oh, that looks you know, beat up and ragged, but. You know, the price, you know, it's old, old and rare and the price on them, you, know, you look at it, you know, $4,000. Right. Now, this is a picture from Gizzard standing at the upper level on the north side of the building, looking down at the lower level from the northwest towards the southeast. So mm -hmm. it's a really good picture and exactly what you're talking about. This particular guy, right, people in this booth here, like, like for one thing, when I ever did the cowboy deck. Uh, the cards for the old West deck. I mean, I, I included the yellow boy and when I was doing the data for it, there's no, not the yellow boy, the um, volcanic. And when you, when I was doing the research for the volcanic, they claimed that there was a volcanic carbine and there's only really a volcanic pistol, I think, or something mm -hmm. new. One of the two, either there was always a, everybody thinks of the volcanic as a pistol, I guess. And there's also a carbine. And whatever it was, I ended up getting a picture of it because they owned one and they had it sitting there on the table. But some of these things aren't even for sale. Like they just bring them out just so that yeah. they can let people experience them, have those conversations. And, you know, if you're a hardcore collector and you've got a gun that's very rare and you go to the largest show in the world, what is it worth to you to have somebody come up and give you more information about the thing that you care about most, right? Like oh, yeah. to get together like a new contact or somebody that can supply like the correct bolt for something uh that's why these people show up and don't have nothing to sell because they're there to continue on the legacy or the the collection or the interest or writing the book or something you know whatever they're doing but then also there's just people that yeah they think nothing they own is invaluable and everything is the most they've ever seen plus 50 bucks mm -hmm. but um uh but then you get everything in between so this where you can kind of see this guy has a piece of coat uh, clothesline and then he's got paper a clothesline or clothes paper what is it clothes pinned to the clothesline is a bunch of like price tags that are like in probably in espanol and uh like with a picture and like everything you'd see in like a catalog online or whatever that's definitely somebody who's been to a gun show every weekend, you know, forever. That's his job is to set up the gun shows and they answer every question. You know, they've got a cash register with like four different internet connections. So there's no problem ever uh, running a credit card. And 
there's a few of those, but they're definitely down here. The ones that are there are, you can kind of see them in here. Um, yeah, I was fascinated. There, there was a one place that had the, the guns of John Browning. You know, it's just a display and showed all the different uh, guns and, and stuff that he designed. And Oh, really? Now that was a personal collection? Like a yeah, I, well, I'll, I, I don't know if it was a personal collection or if it was some kind of museum collection, but it was... It was along along there where the uh, where the wall is where the you get the upper and lower levels along that wall. Okay, so on the that's actually a place where normally they'll have like the collectors groups, and I don't know if that's always just one person or if it's like the whole Ruger group brings all theirs together to have the collection complete for the show, mm -hmm. or sometimes it is just one guy. But um, I think I know what you're talking about. Like right at the bottom, or right at, on the bottom level, right where it goes to the top. That right. strip there, that strip is almost always like the Ruger collection and the Smith and Wesson. One time they had an old lathe running or some old machine running that was from back in the day. But here's the thing: the reason I ask is that at other times, one of the things that the NRA does is, I guess you would say, um, sponsor or facilitate. I guess a museum competition and that museum competition roams or it, it goes to different gun shows. So occasionally when I've been at Wanamaker, they'll have the NRA museum ex competition, I think they call it there. And it'll be like, bring your uh, display and set up. And it'll be like, I don't know, maybe three or four rows of the gun show that are uh, dedicated to this NRA competition or display. Anyway, you can just, as an attendee, you just walk around and look. There's nothing for sale, really. It's just people's collections of these displays set up, but they're actually competing with each other. And then at the end of the show, one of them, I guess, wins. And that's something that they'll do at Wanamaker, then they'll do it here, then they'll do it there, and it'll eventually get its way back to Wanamaker. Um, I learned about it after having seen it a couple of times, I just never realized there was a reason for it to be there. And I didn't run, I didn't understand why it wasn't there always. And then I'm trying to think the last couple of times I have, it's been a while since they've had it. And I'm wondering if what you saw was that, or if it was just the um, kind of more typical standard group of the um, I guess mm -hmm. collectors. It was a pretty good, shows. pretty decent size display. But Oh yeah, it, it takes really, that really. whole thing from the north to the south, like all along that wall, I guess you call it. Yeah, the display, the the Ruger collection I'd love to see is the one that uh, Brownells or Hornady have. Uh, they had it set up with uh, Bill Ruger that uh, a certain serial number when they, every time they made a new gun and that certain serial number came up, it got shipped to Brownells. Oh, okay. Or Hornady. Yeah, so, now is that on uh, display someplace? It is not on display that I know of. I think Hornady has one too, uh, but it you know every Ruger that they've made since they started this deal with them, and every one of them is the same serial number. No, yeah, I've seen that kind of stuff. In fact, when I did one of my first factory tours, that was something that I found out about that. Um, and it's not like one, two, or three always. So in fact, it's almost never like one, two, or three. Right? It's something like that means something to them. Like you know. The guy from Phillips 66 probably asked for sale number 66 or something. Yeah. So, yeah I think, uh, I don't know if Brownells is like 14 or something like that. So every time there's a new model, every time there's a ser the serial number 14, that one is designated to go to Brownells. Well, now, is that on display someplace? I don't think that one's on display. Um, it's kind of in their personal collection. Because I went to, the, well, you're in Iowa, but I've been to the Brownells, whatever you call it, their house main facility right off the highway there mm -hmm. then yeah maybe need if they put that in display somewhere in there for people to see it but uh, i think right now it's just sitting in their personal vault huh. well i'm sure it's not something i'm sure it is something that that will eventually be mm -hmm. they know how to promote or whatever yeah okay so uh this is another one i don't know this person sounds sarah turnball I don't know why the name sounds familiar, but that was a pretty good picture again of standing on the top level, looking down at the lower right. level again. And it's amazing now, how wide that building is. Oh, it, I mean, each, when length, you look at this, dude, it's it's almost like six gun shows. So, like, this is a gun show, like a normal gun show. That's a big normal gun show. Like, this would be a giant gun show. Like, there's another gun show, another gun show. Like, it it's huge. Yeah, and it's not like 
this is a regular gun show building next to a regular gun show building. Like this is four regular gun show buildings under mm -hmm. this one roof. Um, is this the table from this year? That was no, not. Four uh, weeks. No, it's not. It's just 74 weeks ago. So uh, one of the things we started doing back in the day is uh, doing the gun channels picture. I don't know if people do other with that anymore. Um, and I don't know, a couple of back many years ago now, uh, like I say, the gun channels folks started showing up and lending our assistance and expertise or whatever as um, uh, media. And we would uh, work, well, we work with the, the show to uh, uh, help promote the attendees and the whole show itself. And uh, you'll see a lot of these pictures. Just yeah, my even plan was to get more video and more pictures. Um, I was just trying to, you know, being the first time there, I was trying to enjoy the show, trying to get a, a, an idea of what was there, the lay of the land. I figured towards the end of the day, I would go out and do some, you know, some video and pictures and maybe uh, talk to a couple of the vendors. Uh, unfortunately, um, I didn't know that the guys were going to kind of, you know, want to leave at 3, 3.30. And that's about the time I was out of money and was ready to kind of just sit down for a minute, collect my thoughts, and then go out and start filming. So. Well, like oh. I was saying, that's no problem. I mean, you have it's it's overwhelming. It's drinking from a fire hose. It's so mm -hmm. big. And you can't prepare yourself for just how big it is. And yeah. then, you know, it's not like uh, uh, every time you walk around the block, there's another McDonald's or there's another Kentucky Fried Chicken. So you're just looking at six of the same thing over and over. Every single thing is different, pretty much. Yeah. So there's no, like, booth set up over here and over there in the third place. And it um, took me all that time to kind of get my bearings. You know, by about three o'clock, I was ready. Okay, I kind of have an idea now where I might want to go or what I might want to do. Oh. But, you know, I was I was expecting to go and be overwhelmed, and I was more overwhelmed than I was expecting. So I finally found one. There's uh, 4.2 miles for just the upper level, whatever year that was, 57 weeks ago. So that makes it 2018. So, yeah, uh, eight, nine for the whole thing so then uh going home was it a bunch of people sleeping and one guy driving as fast as he can yeah. it was relatively quiet going home it was and okay it, so it wasn't so like a the nice thing because i wasn't driving it didn't seem like nine and a half hours <laughs> um did the guy have help did anybody help the tag team or anything no he he was a trooper i'm sure we we would have jumped in there and helped him but he and then he had two hours left to go after he dropped us off. Dang. Well, that's definitely. Uh, and they, and, and the worst part, the thing that I feel bad on is that the guy who owned the van and his son who drew, did the driving, they didn't buy anything. Well, okay. Don't feel bad, though. So, obviously, they have some reason to want to do it, right? And mm -hmm. they don't just like to waste gas. Maybe they do. Maybe well, they, they, they enjoyed the company. They enjoy the camaraderie and they like enjoy going down there and seeing if they can find something. Um, the old man, I was talking to him and there was something up here that he wanted better than what he was finding down there. Exactly. And that's what I was going to, I mean, there's so much going on. So I'll go to a gun show. I haven't been able to buy stuff at gun shows. I can't even remember last time, 2017 maybe is like, maybe not even then probably the last time I had money to actually spend, like when I bought stuff just for the consumerism probably like in 15 before i started going into 2a stuff um so it's been forever but i still go to as many gun shows as i possibly can um because partially because what you just said the ability to understand what your stuff is still worth your collections are still worth or what's available um being able to make contacts with people that collect your stuff or seeing who's still around or um, if you're trying to sell stuff, you, you know, you know, we kind of keep a finger on a pulse of what's interested, what people getting, are interested idea in. idea how the market's doing. And yeah. And uh, and then the idea of just going down and, and what's the word? Like, it's like going to a concert. You don't come home from a concert with a CD, right? You don't come home from, a, I don't know, sports, but you don't come home from sports with a ball, right? You come home with the, with the having done the thing. So that's part of it is going to the show and to, and to recharge your batteries, your gun batteries, and and to see how the community is evolving. And the fact that they keep going is great because it seems like that means they haven't found any burnout. They haven't found any discouragement or any reason to, to flee from it. 
we know that everything's changing, that uh, uh, the everything's changing. I mean, the, the like I was saying before, the gun shows themselves have changed by outside influences and the promoters just, you know, not being prepared and reacting instead of doing things intentionally to change it. Not all of them, but you know, mm -hmm. the majority. And then uh, just the gun ownership is different. The old folks are dying off. Their collections are being either sold or moved or gone. Like think about, you know, the, the our folks generation is if they're still kicking, you know, they're potentially selling stuff off to pay bills, selling stuff off because the kids don't want it anymore and they might as well get rid of it. Right. Some of that stuff is moving hands. You know, the younger old guy gets it from the younger old lady or something and vice versa. But, um, you know, some of that stuff's moving down a generation and new collectors. But a lot of that, unfortunately, a lot of that stuff is going to some gun shop. And it's, I don't know what this is. I don't appreciate it. I don't have the ability or resources to reach out. So it's going to end up going to somebody. I don't want to talk about it, but I've seen some horrible situations where like a really interesting thing went to somebody who I know it was going to like live in a shed or in a boat or like yeah. some ammo, you know, as an ammo collector, I'm like, that's, that's Chinese steel core ammo. That's not importable. That's interesting stuff. And mm -hmm. while this store, you know, does have it on the shelf for some reason, like, and you can buy it. Like, I know what you're going to do and you're going to take it and go up that hill right now and shoot it into that mountain. Like, I know what you're doing with this ammo and you don't care about money. And you, you bought that ammo. And I know that it's just a bunch of, you know, I spent cases on the ground right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> damn, like, you know, so th that happens. But um, because of that or whatever, it's fun to go to shows and to uh, kind of keep up with what's who's still out there, what your stuff is, in, you know, and then to find the new stuff. Can you imagine being a guy who's been going to a gun show for a long time? Let's say in Iowa, what do you people do? Grow corn. That's all they do. Yeah. <laughs> so they're growing corn and it's got to, I can't imagine what it's like. You probably get up at 4 a.m., start growing corn, go to bed at like 1 a.m., get up and do the whole thing over again, right? Mm -hmm. So they come up for air once or twice a year, go to a gun show. There's like 3D printing now. What? Like there's websites that sell ammo. What? Like being able to come in and see how things are changing. There's SBRs now. Women shoot guns. So they make them in pink, right? Like yeah. that's gotta be neat. Like going to a gun show at that scale. I can't even imagine. And just being like having that finger on the pulse over the years. Um, like I say, I kind of get the experience out here, but this show it's big, it's big than a regular gun show, but it's a quarter of the size of Wanamaker, a third of the size of Wanamaker. If it's lucky, uh, it's nothing like Wanamaker. No. All right. Yeah, so I can show big hour, hour, right? Was that hour a hard hour? Do you got to get? No, it was an easy hour. I'm, I, okay. I'm fine at the moment. Um, go ahead and finish your thoughts. Right. Go ahead. You know the the shows here. Um, you start seeing the same guy, same people over and over, the same guns over and over. Um, you know what dealers are usually are. You know, will treat people pretty fairly, and you know what dealers don't. And, but it's always kind of interesting to go and, and see what you find because. I don't buy stuff. Don't have only bought one gun on the internet. Um, I like to be able to go and find them, touch them, take a look at them, you know, handle them before I pull the trigger on them. And I've found some pretty good deals at, at shows. Um, and you know, sometimes I find something I never knew that existed, and it's at a really good price. So I go ahead and pick it up, and then figure out what it is. But, you know, it's all, all been a learning process for me, you know, even though, you know, dad worked for Brunel's and and I was around it and he had stuff downstairs. And if I wanted to take the kids shooting, I could just go over to my dad's and we'd go out in the backyard. Uh, it's just interesting now that I'm, I'm getting into some of this stuff. Uh, you know, that rolling block is going to be fun for me, having to chamber cast it, figure out what it's chambered in, hunt down the brass for it and stuff so I can actually take it out and shoot it and shoot some history yeah there's so much when you get into that stuff to figure out how much of it is the same you know unique if it's been remanufactured in an arsenal you know you can kind of mm -hmm. do what i call that like quincy type of stuff you can go back and do the forensics on on that yeah I, i've inadvertently done it just because i was bored or just because i didn't know you could do it and i did it like to research sks's and mosins and stuff stuff that i was only like a quarter interested in but i was at work and i was bored i was at the gun shop and i was bored so oh yeah this kind of like working and yeah you can go click on this click on this and then find a forum somewhere back in the day forums were gold i mean they archived information publicly so people could get on and debate whether or not it was accurate or if they liked the interpretation right. but 
it was all there. And if you had a half an hour to read, you could get a really good summary, really good uh, deep dive, the kids call it. Or yeah, in the, like the particular eras, you know, the, you know, a guy handed me a uh, Martini Henry and said, here, now figure out how to shoot it. You know, and I had to go out and find a, how to form the ammo and, and make the ammo. But, you know, that, that particular area where it's, okay, we're going for muzzle loaders and now they're taking muzzle loaders and starting to convert them to the single shot cartridge guns. And then you've got this small little bit of gun, you know, firearms that were built specifically as a single shot cartridge gun before, um, you know, your smokeless powder and your repeaters and stuff took over. So it's, it's interesting sometimes when you get in those little niches. Dude, you can't even like think about it. So right now there's a bunch of people that are like 3D printing, right? Well, a minute ago it was yeah. like, what? Your Glock is made out of plastic. What? Mm -hmm. And a minute before that is like aluminum, a frame made out of aluminum. What's wrong with you? What are you right. thinking? This is a gun we're talking about. And before that it was like semi-automatic. What are you talking about? This is our gun we're talking about, a revolver. And then it was like, what do you mean boring through the whole cylinder to put cartridges in? We don't even know if cartridges are going to stick around more than a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're talking at a time when, uh, from, and I don't even know this, I'm just like bird's eye view, but back in the olden days, the United States, right, we're a melting pot of everything, including tech, and all tech is guns, right? Yeah. So when we got over here, we were a bunch of like Swedish people and English people and German people all button heads with each other. I don't know if they spoke the same language, because who cares? You know, there's just a bunch of weird Europeans that got sick of living in weird Europe, and they came over here to live in new country and they're all like oh look at how your gun works and the other gun's like yeah look at how your guns work and then eventually the europe's were like hey let's just take all your guns and we were like no mm -hmm. how about no and they were like oh yeah we're gonna take them all and we're gonna take all ours back first and now we're gonna take all yours and they didn't figure out that what we did is say let's take the best pieces of your gun and the best pieces of our gun and let's make a gun that you know the british or whoever europe's were shooting guns that shot big giant let's call them 50 cal balls so you could get like eight balls out of a pound of lead or whatever the math was back then. And mm -hmm. that was like a determining factor of how their infantry could do whatever. Well, we decided in the United States, let's not be stupid about it. And let's shoot a thing that's much smaller so we can get like, I don't know, let's say, say 50 balls out of a pound of lead. So our guys can reload faster, shoot longer. Our guns could shoot faster and further than their guns, more accurately than their guns. And we won because we incorporated a bunch of stuff working together and made technology you know, harness technology and all that. The reason I bring all that up is because this was all on the days before interchangeable parts, right? So when we're talking, we just saved all of the rest of humanity from mm -hmm. slavery and in monarchies and all this garbage, and we freed the you know thoughts of mankind or whatever, and created this new country. And it was literally based on the innovation of technology and firearms, right? These were all being made by craftsmen. So all of these. Kentucky and Pennsylvania rifles are like, that's made by Charlie, the Pennsylvania guy, or that's made by Bob, the Pennsylvania rifle guy or whatever. And Bob would scribble his with this and, you know, Charlie would scribble his with that. And Charlie shot a little bit to the left, but I like it that way. And Bob's had a little bit of a weird cant usually because he was whittling each one out of a piece of wood, right? So mm -hmm. all of these guns had their own little niche and it was sort of like, I like so-and-so's burrito or I like so-and-so's boots, right? Because everything was made by hand. And then you get into what you're talking about, where they go from like, I like so-and-so. It's like, I like Nike or I like Magpul, right? Because of whatever marketing or whatever reason I own it and I love it. Well, they went from, I everybody makes their own and you got to like the one you bought it from to like, oh, there's just interchangeable parts. It's just a gun, you know, it's just a model. Can you imagine that jump? We get all freaked out about, I don't like Glock's grip angle. Imagine grandpa and grandson at that era. Like, mm -hmm. Grandpa, these are interchangeable parts. Keep your interchangeable parts, Sonny. They didn't free us from Europe. No interchangeable part, you know, defended us from the English. Can you imagine you, those kind yeah. of gun debates back in the day at the tap? Yeah, and we start seeing the, uh, you know, prior to World War One, all the stuff in Europe that was being developed, you know. You know, you get one, oh, this guy's got a repeater now. And, you know, against guys that only have single Who shots. Who needs six shots? Yeah. Are you, you going to take that into a school? What are you mm -hmm. going to do with six shots? Take down a war boat? Like, what's wrong with you? You don't need six shots to defend yourself from all of England. 
or whatever. Like, yeah, and you got, you know, okay, we've gone from black powder, now we got black powder repeaters, and all of a sudden the French come up with smokeless powder, and everybody's scrambling, okay, now we got to develop something for the smokeless powder. And it's just really interesting how, Super and the awesome. United States sitting here, yeah, we've got, uh, you know, trapdoor Springfields, we're okay. But no, and, and the reason we're kind of developed, spinning off and kind of playing with some of the history topics, like I say, I'm just barely bird's eye view of like gun history, but it's super neat. Like every time it's like looking at a fractal image, like whatever, go look at a Mendelbrock set. And when you zoom into it, it's got like similar repeating shapes and stuff. And it just kind of always repeats. It's like a, you know, computer uh, screensaver or something. It's just an endlessly kind of similar repeating shape that just keeps happening. And it happens like that with guns. You get into it and like just us kind of riffing there. Um, all of those things that there are to discover and talk about, everybody at these gun shows, I guess if I go back to looking at a picture of that show and uh, the tables and whatnot, like everybody in behind one of those tables, how come it won't go back Everybody who's standing in front of one of these tables is buying something and wondering, or maybe, you know, a knowledgeable person. But most of the people sitting behind these tables are knowledgeable about what's in front of that table. So the conversations that are happening, part of it walking through a gun show is disc discretion, right? Knowing when to just keep walking because I can't afford it or I have too many hobbies already. Like the, the cannons. A lot of people don't even want to hear about toy cannons that are like less than 50 bucks, all you gotta do is buy some black powder and you can shoot everything from a wad of toilet paper to, you know, which makes a lot of noise because you create a little bit of compression and all that comes out is like the wad, right? Uh, mm -hmm. All the way up to shooting little projectiles and having real fun with shooting the thing for accuracy uh, inside of a house. Like you can shoot indoors with a, the right kind of cannon, right? Anyway, people don't want to hear about that because it could become a massive hobby. Think about you, you're walking past people that are talking about stuff that could be infinitely interesting super expensive in the long run or just a massive time waste. Like I, I, I've walked past conversations about like old fashioned handcuffs or something, or, you know, some police stuff at a table or maybe a, something about Vietnam. And I'm like, it's like flipping channels on the cable. Like if you flip channels forever, seeing what the stuff you could watch, you never have a chance to watch anything. But as soon as you start watching predator, you don't realize that three clicks down was red dawn and you could have watched that. So uh, walking around the show, you're going to hear people talking about stuff or somebody will, you know, you'll walk up and somebody go, oh, a Damascus shotgun here. Let me grab that from under the table and pulls it up. And now you potentially could listen to a conversation that it's going to blow your mind. Well, I had a guy, I was looking at Winchester 97. Winchester 97. He's, you know much about those? I said, no, okay. I know of them, but you know, I don't know a whole lot about what I'm looking at. This is probably one of the first ones I've, I've actually handled. It's not a Norenko copy. Oh, yeah, you got to look at over here, you know, watch for cracks here because I like to crack. And, you know, you look at over here and this and that. And I looked at it, I said, is this a takedown model? Says, yeah, yeah, that's a takedown model. And the serial number should be the same on the butt in the barrel. And uh, the, there's no serial number on the barrel on this one. I'd put it back on the rack and walk away. <laughs> but, you know, that was something I would have never known. But there's a guy standing there that was knowledgeable about it and happy to share it to me with me. And again, if you've got time or if it was the other way around, you went with nine people and you were done at 3 p.m., but they weren't <laughs> and they were going to be there for the rest of the show or whatever. I mean, you could I mean, it's not like there's a big sign. You can just tell who to talk to. But there's certainly the potential to find somebody to chat with. talk mm -hmm. to about stuff. Yeah. I'm and sure the history that's on those right. tables that I think that's, you know, there's something special about Wanamaker because of the history that's on the on those tables and all the, the different stuff and unique stuff and you can go from you know the really old stuff or you know, if you're into that modern stuff and that tactical stuff and what's new and what's you know cutting edge and what's going on that's going to be there too so it's just a wide range of of what you can do and like you said you know maybe there's 100 boxes you're looking at and it's going to cover 70 to 75 or better So I asked a little while ago for any last questions. We'll get to that here. I was, I'm going to go through and look again. Uh, on the screen, I've just got some uh, little tiny bullets I bought at a, from an ammo guy uh, one year. Uh, I remember that I was lining this up when I was talking to Foos, not Foss. Before there was a Foss, there was a Foos. And uh, he doesn't go to gun shows anymore. But back in the day, uh, we were sitting there chatting at one of the hotels. And I was uh, setting this up. Uh, out of a, like a little baggie. I bought like a baggie of 
odd rounds and I got this whole crazy selection. That's a 22 Magnum ish, not really a Magnum, but close to being the Magnum. A uh, 22 long rifle and everything here is smaller than a 22 long rifle, so it's pretty fun. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go see if we've got any uh, other pictures. Um, Mystic is saying it's not that much walking. Um, well, I don't know. I guess like if you were a nurse, like I can't imagine somebody who walks for a living, they probably don't even think about a big gun show because they're just doing the same amount of walking as a normal day or whatever. I think we kind of, I'd mentioned earlier the concrete. Uh, did you have good shoes? Were you ready for a day as walking? Yeah, I was ready for a day of walking and I've got good shoes and I'm on concrete quite a bit. So that didn't bother me so much. Ghost is saying he's feeling it. Did you get sore? I think yeah, that was when he got bucked off that uh, Bronco or whatever he was doing at his birthday. No, but I'm saying, did you get sore? Oh, no, around? I didn't get sore from walking around. Um, and here's something. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, but did anybody, was there any issues with any of the BS infringements on our faces or whatever? Like, was anybody paranoid about that? Mm -hmm. or No. There were there was no issues with it. Um, I, I kind of overheard one of the security guards on the way out saying, "Well, we should probably do say something to him. Hey, please wear it, or can you wear it?" But he says, "At this point, there's not much we can do. There's more people here that than and nobody was really first. bothering with that. It was nope. non. It was it a was freedom. A non area. It was freedom and, area. And I'm guessing." Like everywhere, what I'm hearing is that's just creating the immunity, herd immunity stuff. So mm -hmm. it sounds like it's a win-win for everybody. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to even talk about that stuff anymore. Uh, let's see, Weston's saying, I didn't leave the show till about 5.30 Sunday, which is a long time for this show. That show, they threatened people to keep the vendors in because vendors start leaving at like 1 p.m. on Sunday. So he says, I left till 3, 5 p.m., 5.30 p.m. Sunday. Everything was pretty much cleared out and packed up. Yeah. So um, I've seen it completely packed up and gone by three. Most of the people we go with will leave before the end of the show. I do not understand that. I grew up doing gun shows. Well, I grew up doing gun shows. I grew up attending gun shows as a vendor with the guy that ran Tucson Guns. He was the president of a volunteer. He was the president of a nonprofit promoter, a gun from show promoter that was made up of the vendors at a gun show. So it was a really, really awesome thing that happened here in Arizona for decades where the people that truly loved the gun show were the promoters of it. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, sorry, that was actually, I wouldn't have interrupted if it wasn't amazing potential thing that I'm trying to work out. But anyway, <laughs> good. Uh, that was dead air, and it's good for you. Real shows don't have scripts. Um, totally forgot what we were saying. Um, oh, just the people leaving early. Oh, okay. packing up yeah. and leaving. So, yeah, I don't get it. I was I go to with Bob, and his thing was he was selling. He went to a gun show to make money, to sell stuff, and... So he would stay set up until they kicked him out of the building. Like the, the promoters would say, get out. And Bob, uh, I guess I was saying that he, he was the president of a really cool organization that promoted gun shows for a long time. And then he ran his own gun shows for a long time. So this guy was as much of a fan of gun shows. Well, not quite as much as me, but. Yeah. And if you get three or four more guns in that time, that's three or four more guns. You don't have to pack up in the van and take back with you. Oh, dude, it's way, way more than that, though. It's it's amazing because yeah. it's the I don't understand people. They just never experienced it before. But at the last moments of a gun show, everybody who came there to buy stuff is their their money is burning a hole in their pocket. And every moment they're there, there's fewer and fewer options of stuff to buy. So it's not the matter of three or four. It's more of a matter of if you only sell three or four, you mm -hmm. can sometimes clear your table, which might not have been touched. You'll look at some people who know the deal. 
And it'll be like, wow, this guy didn't even sell nothing this weekend. His table, you know, you notice that his table looks almost the same on Saturday morning as it does on Sunday afternoon. And then, boom, everybody else is gone. And there's, especially at a Wanamaker, where there's so many attendees and so few people left, you know, they're they're going to Wanamaker on a Sunday, anytime on Sunday. And you think you're going to have time to walk the whole show? No, you, there's no way you could see the whole show because it's the show is disappearing as you're walking it on Sunday. It's like mm-hmm. not possible to see it. So there, it's it's crazy how people don't set up, especially at Wanamaker. But um, oh yeah, and as a purchaser, you're probably you know seeing okay now all the clutter's gone. I can focus better. Yeah, uh, exactly. It just it works out so much in your favor. Now I say all that, and I've never made a fortune, but I have certainly wanted to go walk around at the end of the gun show and not been able to because we're just selling hand over fist. Bob, I mean. He knew what he was talking about. He made a lot of money at the end of gun shows. Um, this was the show for an ammo collection. Damn it. I do not want to hear that. I want to hear, like, there wasn't even any collectible ammo there. Because that's all I care about going anymore is just to look at the <laughs> old ammo. I don't really care about talking to the people. Every once in a while, I care about what I own. But it's like, you know, I'm not that interested in every specific. I'm more of just greedy. I want to have as many different shaped bullets that I can possibly get. And there's so many of them that that's you can literally just find every single time I go to a gun show, I can find new bullets. Um, but if I ever get too old, I guess I'll start getting way more interested in the history behind them. But I mean, just looking at this picture, whatever, you pick anything on this table and there's going to be an infinite amount of history because, I mean, there's just every little innovation is represents something. That's why guns are so neat. Mm-hmm. Oh, let's see. Do they have? It's just interesting watching, you know, the development in over the years. Yeah, and in so many different ways. And then, like, I just been doing the history project and stuff, and and never being thought about it. But you know, when World War II ended, there's all this ammo, and I knew from my grandpa back in the day that the stuff that hadn't yet shipped overseas was just flooded the market. Like everything that they were building for war production, and then the war ended, they just kind of said, "Okay, stop and go back to." sewing machines or whatever you were building. So if they had like, you know, tons of stuff that they were about to send over to a war, the war stopped, you know, they probably kept a thing or two, but then mm-hmm. dozens of the things would just get dropped onto the market. And because everybody just got back from war, they were like, I don't want ever see that again. So no, I don't want that. So nobody wanted it. The values dropped to nothing. And it was probably like that with bullets, right? So let's say you're a hunter and you're like, ugh. I'm going to go hunting with a 45 ACP or a 308. There's got to be something better. And I can't even start counting how many people were like, oh, yeah, there's something better. And they started. One of the reasons why so many Mosers were sporterized, you know. Yeah, they they were a dime a dozen at the time. You know, the dad talks about, you know, back in the 60s, there's one thing they knew they'd never run out of. And that would be 30 out six uh, ammunition in sporter or Mosers to sporterize. There was just so many of them. And And that meant you could take. 30 odd six ammo and tweak it, do this to it, do that to it, make it a different caliber. But who cares? Mm-hmm. You're basically starting with 30 odd six and fiddling with it. So you're still going to have it forever. Yeah. And now and you've how, got it. That's how Hornady shoot. got started. You know, they bought up a bunch of surplus powder that the government was going to get rid of. Yeah, all of them. That's literally how all of them started. They, mm-hmm. The ones that exist today, there was a lot more than exist today. But the ones that exist today were the ones that knew how to do it and make money doing it. But they, that's how all of this, every single innovation we see comes from some innovation of or iteration of all that surplus stuff. And that, you know, that happened with the Civil War, that happened with World War One, and it happened with World War Two even more. But um, but anyway, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that... Um, and even to, you know, to a smaller scale, it happened after uh, 1983 when the U.S. government was looking for a new handgun. Now look yeah. at all the designs all that the came out of that. Yeah. Um, and And... And well, Glock, I mean, it was a different country, but that's where Glock comes from, from mm-hmm. that concept. But then when Glock got into that realm and everybody went, oh, now it's not just a novelty for the recreational, but there's like a military contract involved. Let's let's tool up. You kind of um, see that with this new one, you know, they they you know put a bit out for the new uh, handgun that they've the SIG that they've got now. But it's affected the rest of the industry because several other manufacturers have got pistols that they had built for that trial you know the ruger american the smith and wesson m ps and stuff i mean that it just kind of helped kickstart another era of 
firearms and you go we're not seeing it yet but i think down the line when we look back we'll say oh that's kind of where all that started uh, i'm just gonna i don't know where we're at with time so uh i'm just gonna throw out there if i'm cork anybody let me know um so trying to speed up a little bit here since we're going way over an hour um how do you like the dirt track at the gun show yeah we did uh drive around the well we drove around the dirt track back then. I don't know if we were talking. See, now the problem is that looking at the comments now that were placed an hour ago, I'm not sure exactly what we were talking about. But um, uh, I guess Roe Call saying that guy's called the that robot is called the driller. Uh, let's see. Weston is saying the fairgrounds property is actually owned by Tulsa County. So one benefit is the sales tax at the show does not include city tax. I didn't realize. I think I remember that, but I didn't understand why, but uh, it's cool. Uh, can you bring a golf cart? There's rental carts that you can set on like an old guy cart, but, um, and I imagine you could probably bring a Segway. And I, I definitely have seen the little coolers that are go-karts. People drive those around in there. Mostly that's like the big fat vendors who will drive their little cooler go-kart from the car into the place. And then they just have, they're sitting on it all day and then they drive it out. So they won't like drive the aisles with it, but I do see a lot. Like I know of six of them or something that people that have those because they're cool and I always look at them. Um, but I've never seen anybody actually driving carts with them. Um, I don't know how many baby strollers were in there this time. A billion of them or none? There were a few, but no, I didn't see a whole lot. It was so me, packed in there. It was hard to get anything around if you had something like that. Well, that's the thing. I either notice them. It, 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 it's both ways. If I'm sitting behind the table and just sitting there and watching the people go by, that's a whole different experience than when you're one of the people walking by everywhere. So I've had shows both ways as a vendor and as a visitor where you don't even see a baby cart or whatever they're called, like a baby stroller. And then other ones where it's not the, I mean, you know what they look like, so it's not the same one, but I've been to shows where there's, for some reason, like it's the baby show and everybody brought their freaking babies that time or it's some scam where they know they can bring their baby cart and they can put a bunch of stuff on it and everybody figures that out. And then I have no idea, but there's, I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason to it, but I do know that some shows it's like distracting how many of them there are. And I guess now that I'm thinking about it, there's other shows where it wasn't even a thing. Like you don't even think about it because you mm -hmm. may not even have seen one. But I guess this year it wasn't uh, a distraction type of thing. And as always, if there's a bunch of handguns on the table, that's usually the table is packed around. That's true, too. Um, the September Chili Bowl Outlaw Racing is in that building. They fill the whole lower level with dirt for a dirt track. hundred. I think I've heard of that. That uh, Well, I didn't know about the event, but I've heard that they fill it with dirt for racing and stuff. It would have been I amazing. That's really I went to the chili bowl all the time. Those are the ones that told me to stop the diner. Um, but they also do a big RC show, I think, up in the upper area. They've got the RC cars that they race. Oh, yeah, that'd be neat. Like I say, that's a cool building. They've even got a little garden tractor they take and, and groom, the court, groom the track every uh, other race. Because it's a dirt track with the RC stuff. I don't think that's a hard rule. There's plenty of new exhibitors. And exactly, I'm not sure there's too much, but I know that there's precedent. Like, you can't really get up front there unless you've been there for a while. Let's see. If you ever stop at the Hard Rock or River Spirit Casino, get a player's card and gamble. 100 bucks, they will send you free room vouchers for life. Okay, so I'm not looking at the... The thing, uh, the map again. But if you picture where the, because where the um, uh, fairgrounds are that the gun shows held at, right? Kind of in the, I call it the center of town. I'm, I don't know if it's exactly the center or not, but kind of the center of town, Tulsa. And then where that whale was, and then you go north from the whale. You can turn at the whale and go north, and that's where you get to the J.M. Davis Museum. Uh, between those fairgrounds and the whale, there's a, what's it called? The heavy or the Hard Rock Casino. So it's a Casino on an Indian reservation, um, but it's a hard rock hotel, basically. And uh, you can't miss it because it's a massive hard rock sign. And I've never been in it, but I've heard about it a lot. And 
if that's true, maybe that's why I've heard about it so much, but I guess they're real generous to their people that gamble there. It's pretty cool. Uh, I came across an original Russian SKS. They're pressing pricey, but I don't believe they go for what they're asking. Oh, that's the one you're saying Roko was talking about? Uh, once we've seen, it seemed like there was not as many museum displays as there normally is. And that, I guess, would make sense if people who have museum stuff, museum stuff tend to be older. Uh, they were probably scared of catching something, perhaps, That's or just. Kind of what my thought was is there. You know, I heard that there's all these displays and collections and stuff, and I saw a few, but not as many as I thought I would. And I was well, like I say, though, with that, with that traveling COVID NRA. And, well, with that traveling NRA thing, someone could go to the show when the NRA thing is there and go, "Wow, there's a lot of displays here." Because I mean, you're walking through whole aisles where you can't buy anything, right? And they're way bigger than a regular booth. So if you went to one of those, you'd be like, and then, like I say, they happen every so often. So it's not like they're never there and it's not like they're always there. So if you went to one and saw all those and you went to a second one, you might be like, what happened? Because that's what happened to me. I mean, I know that would happen. But um, there's also some that are just always there. So I'm guessing he's talking about those missing. Oh, and then I guess I was also going to say, if you if you go to one of these shows just as, with your collection, you're going there to BS with people. And if you've got just a collection that you're going to shows with, more than likely you've been going to gun shows for a long time. So that means you remember the crazy situation that we talked about in 2013. You remember the weird situation in 2004. For collectors, that was a horrible situation because gun shows had already changed in 2000 where everybody got paranoid for the Y2K and bought all the ammo and, and gun shows started getting really weird uh, as far as losing all the authentic, awesome stuff. And it was changing into more of like, just bring your garbage from the surplus store. Um, mm -hmm. like this off this rack stuff, not the actual surplus, but the garbage, the, the prepper stuff, we called it survivalist stuff back in the old days. Um, so these people that have been through a lot of craziness, they, they're not just gun shy. They're just experienced. They know that a show after or in the midst of hype, is not a show to talk to people. It's a show to be in the way of the people that are there to buy cheap ammo. And if they went to a gun show to buy cheap ammo, it means they've never been to a gun show before because that's not yeah. how it works. And that means that they're going to stand in front of your booth with really expensive stuff and they're just going to be angry and ask you to buy ammo. And you're going to be like, I'm here to talk about old fashioned Rugers. And they're going to go, so is that a gun? Is that an ammo? Where do I buy ammo? You know, it's going to be super boring and shitty for them. So even yeah. if they're not as scared of something, they might just realize that it's not the show. It's not yeah. worth the Does game. Does that holds. shoot like a Glock? <laughs> yeah, seriously. And then you know, there's nothing wrong with all that. It's just that, mm -hmm. you know, they're not, that they don't go to the gun show to, to be annoyed and to be in the way of people. So they're going to, I could see them not showing up. Hopefully it's not the latter that they've passed away because they're also mostly ancient. And I mean, I'm old and these people are way older than me. So at some point they're not going to be going to shows, right? Yeah, uh, Dead yeah. Horse threw a 20 thumb in there. Thank you for that. That's telling the logarithm that it's worth watching. I don't really care about the, the numbers as much as appreciating people that keep the awareness out there. We shoot guns, right? Does that mean you only shoot semis? No, you probably have shot a revolver if you don't own them. You've probably shot a lever action even if you don't own them. If you've shot an AR-15, you don't own one, right? Like these are just skill sets we have. Uh, so now justify to me why you wouldn't use the logarithm on YouTube the same way that you would use a revolver correctly. If somebody hands you your the revolver and you start doing some bullshit from a movie and ruin a thousand dollar gun, not only would you look like an asshole and lose a friend, but you'd seriously realize that you're a dimwit, right? You would not yeah, do that. Yeah. So why would you use the internet? Like, oh, I'm too dumb to use the internet or I don't have the gumption to want to click on that button because I don't like YouTube. Well, pfft. Start using the internet. We are not going to win by having a bunch of people attempting. So thanks to Dead Horse for keeping that subtle awareness out there. Most people aren't going to take a portion of their show and focus on the fact that most of us are just being dumb about not using our, our abilities out here, using our tools. Uh, DJ is out there. Um, had to miss Tulsa. He's going to go in uh, December. I saw a question from his coming up. If y'all want to have a conversation with each other, just get a room. Just go get a room and have your conversations over there. Um, make fun of I wear something. Here we go. Where'd you go? Dang it, I just saw that. It said Q. Q. 
Uh, if you go again this fall, what's on your list to buy? So are you planning on going again? I'm assuming the group of I, people are I, coming down again. Yeah, I do plan on going again. Um, I was looking at uh, lever actions, but they were going pretty for pretty good pricing from what I see. Yeah, so I'd love to add a rifle caliber lever action to the collection. Um, other than that, I, I just kind of have some stuff in the back of my mind that I'm always kind of looking for. Um, I might get a side-by-side -side double shotgun, you know, some kind of a coach gun, only because I've wanted one. Um, you know, when I was growing up, you know, the bad guy always had the sawed-off double, you know, side-by-side. -side. So that would be something I'd be looking for. But other than that, you know, I, I wasn't looking for a that single-shot two two three that I purchased. Um, I kind of had one in the back of my mind. Yeah, it'd be nice to have one. And this one just kind of popped up. And oh, that's a that's a nice gun. It's in really good shape. It's a great price, it, with no brainer. It, and it filled a hole in the collection. I actually went out and shot that one to, this afternoon, and it shoots really nice. And what are the odds that that'll change by the time it shows up again in no, what, November? Mm -hmm. I always kind of have a, a, a rolling list in my head. Um, I don't usually go looking for something specific. Um, so I'm usually look. I'm like Clover Tech. I'm an opportunist buyer. When I see something and it's a good price mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and it fills a hole in my collection, I'll usually then pick it up. Yeah, I think you're. I, don't, I think it's it's silly. It's foolish. Like tactically to. Like strategically to go to a show like that and not be ready for an opportunity mm -hmm. because you're going to potentially find something that is on you couldn't plan for so you can plan for whatever you want and you can plan to be disappointed as part of your planning but it's really hard to plan to be amazed <laughs> like yeah. it'd be nice to be amazed but when you get amazed you better be ready for it i was kind of surprised to find that rolling block for the price i did and you know as good a bore and stuff as that's got in it that should be a nice rifle Well, let's see. And again, you know, it was an opportunity. Opportunity. Uh, I like looking for old reloading manuals. A lot of the information in the older reloading manuals is not printed in the newer ones. Well, that's interesting. I would, there's not only a couple of people that have whole islands. So an island would be like if there's rows of tables at a gun show and then there's rows going perpendicular to that, that's going to create, you know, little city blocks or basically like if the walkways or roads that you know there's little city blocks worth of tables so typically somebody has a table or two sometimes you have an end cap so you have the couple of tables at the end of a row uh, where people kind of walk around the whole thing but other times people buy the whole island like all the tables and sometimes that's as many as 25 tables or something so there's this one guy right near us in the northwest side of the building almost always who's got one two three four, i don't know at least 10 or 12 tables i would think maybe more and it's all books. Like there's no dead space on that table. I barely I think he has to bring another table for himself inside of all that to put his cash register and stuff on. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not only that, and then other people. There's the one downstairs. Blue Blue Books is there, and then there's wait. Now that I'm thinking about it, two or three people downstairs that just bring entire like libraries of gun books, not just books, but gun books. And then with all those tables, just tons of books. I look at books, and books are one of them things gun books at least there's some gun books that if people don't know it that they're worth a lot of money like you can find them for a buck you can find them for here's a bunch of books but i don't know what they are and i have them all for a buck and they're worth a lot more than a buck mm -hmm. so i kind of i'm aware of some of those and they can be gun books that i have no idea like i just can tell by looking at them sometimes like uh oh that's and there's like information in a lot of those books that you'll not find on the web yeah so um yeah i think that if you're a book collector you would need every moment you possibly could for Wanamaker because there's so many, so much potential for books. And because somebody can have a milk crate of books, it's going to take you a, a while every time you find that kind of thing. But that's a good one. I don't think I've tried. I've, I've, I have an eye out for manuals and a couple of books, but I haven't ever just went there for books. Here's the problem with books. That's heavy. I mean, guns are heavy. Ammo is heavy. But I mean, damn, books are pretty heavy too, especially when you start adding them up. Uh, were there cigs for sale there? Like cigarettes? Mm, I don't know. I don't 
don't think that I don't know. It's for sale there. Uh, maybe like if something like there was ever such a thing as like a Smith and Wesson novelty pack or some sort of advertising pack. I'm sure that or cigars maybe, but uh, or does he mean cigars? I don't think I've ever seen like a table of cigars. I don't think there's a rule against it. I just don't think it's that big a thing to people. Maybe it ruins the cigars to have them sitting at a gun show. Probably ruins them, right? You wouldn't bring real cigars out and just leave them laying in that horrible building. I mean, it's a nice building, but it's not good for cigars. Pretty sure they're supposed to be in fancy conditions. Yeah, and humidors and stuff. Half of our comments are just these dudes all chatting with each other. Um, I need 22 TCM or arms. I need definitely, I think I have a, is TCM the first one? Whatever the second one, whenever they flipped it around and put the bullet in backwards, I think they gave me one of those as a dummy round. But for years, I would go to SHOT Show and ask them for a dummy round of 22 TCM and they would never give me one. And I've never found one anywhere else either, but I kind of wanted one straight from them and they would never give me one. I've even contemplated horking one, but I didn't. And uh, they finally gave me one, but I think it was whatever they called the one that, is it a nine millimeter? Or is all 22 TCM nine millimeter? Yeah, right? it's, it's nine millimeter case neck down to 22. So I think they first came out with it and it was for the 40, or it was for the, whatever it was, they flipped the projectile around because it was too long for something. And they flipped the projectile around and they called it another version. And then I think that's the one that they gave me. Uh, let's see. So I guess, was that where I already asked for questions? Yeah. yeah I think okay, one of the so most we're... interesting things I found there um, had a Polish P64 cutaway model. And I saw What's a couple. Of, um, it was the Polish Army's uh, 9mm Makarov. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Police, uh, military and police. Um and this one was the, the cutaway version. It was all cut away so you could see how the, the mechanism and everything worked. They're neat. Uh, kind of we neat. saw one that was, a, uh, what was it? I guess, a German Mauser, the broom handle. And yeah. and there's there's different ways that they'll do them. This one was different. It was cut like in half, like with some kind of a laser or water jet or something. So it was more of a presentation thing. But when the cutaways are neat. It was the kind of cutaway that somebody did like with a war gun or something that like the factory did to teach it's something like the the factory did to show how the mechanism worked and teach and yeah those are way cooler because they usually know what they're doing and they cut them strategically so that like you can still let's yeah, say cut, put a yeah. bullet in it or some little window like yeah you could probably yeah. put a put a, a dummy round in them and it would cycle and the trigger would you, work like you, say, you would get like a little window of where something was happening so like mm -hmm. strategically so that they could show you like this is where it rotates or that's where the spring engages right. there's all these little things and then they usually take the sections that are like so that you can like they indicate where the windows are with paint jobs and stuff and yeah those things could be super neat and on the yeah. surface you're like oh that's a gun with a bunch of holes in it until you start to fiddle with it and especially when you know how the gun works and then you get to kind of it's like a weird puzzle that comes to life and you get to see where all the windows happen as it's moving and stuff and that part yeah that can blow you away I mean, yeah, I've seen collections of just, uh, what's that called again? The just cut the, away. uh, just cutaways. Yeah. Uh, and I think that probably comes from the olden days when, you know, the big World War II ones that were oversized for like a classroom, mm -hmm. people had to think that was cool and then started making them. And I don't know, I've never thought about it, but I don't know if people just kept making their own. Cause again, you could get a gun for really cheap. And like, if I already got six of them, why not cut one into a cutaway? Cause it's super cool. Um, or if the factories made them, because I know a couple of companies make them like just to sell to people because people want them. Um, but yeah, most some of them make them just see off their salesman samples so they can show, you know, this is the safety that's inside here and this is how this spring works. And you know, so you know, yours is when they're selling them. Yeah, yeah, here's when they're selling them. Mm -hmm. Or the one you're talking about is Yeah, the one was I told you was a military one, but you know, I'm sure it was some kind of presentation piece to show how it would work or. It was interesting. Uh, the other one I put on uh, on Instagram was the you know, the American Coon rifle, and somebody had a Winchester rifle that they had, uh, you know, really nicely sculpted a piece of wood on there and put like a sixty or ninety um, flashlight on the bottom of it. Your hose clamps and all. There it is. 
Yeah, but that was cutting edge at the time. Uh, this mm-hmm. was before Streamlight, or I mean, before uh, Maglite. Yeah, those yeah. were cutting edge the at the time thing, for those flashlights. The only thing you could do was add more cells, basically, add more 1.5s. So mm-hmm. 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, probably. You can tell they took the end cap off and put another body in there. And it was a special extension body because it doesn't have the switch. But, uh, and then that would give them. Uh, well, I guess nine volts, three, six, nine volts to throw into a different kind of light bulb that could handle a nine volt battery and therefore blow away a regular one yeah. and a half volt that most of our yeah, flashlights. It's just the ingenuity of you know somebody putting that together. Yeah. And then that specific time. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, that was neat. Was that on a shotgun or is that a rifle? It was a rifle. Okay. So. He called it a coon rifle. A well, yeah, because you would take that out at night, I guess. Pretty Not much like everywhere. Raccoons. Well, at least until recently, pretty yeah. much everywhere. The only thing you could shoot at night was raccoons. And then you'd basically go outside, listen to the top of a tree or whatever, hear them up there, turn the light on, they'd go, huh? And then you shoot them in the face when they look at you. <laughs> um. All right, so then the 21 is a straight-up race gun. They're talking about Glocks, I guess. Um, 145 guy, even though I only own one, seven, or eight, nine millimeter, I do have 1,000 rounds of 45. I don't know what I'm bragging about their ammo, I guess. We loaded for a couple of guys that have Mausers. One has an eight-something sport rise in a 308. Uh, I never had a Mauser. I never got into them. Um, then... These guys are talking to each other. As a uh, bolt they, action, the Mausers are nice rifles. That's I mean, they're I'm smooth. Talking. I got no problem. It's just that I don't. I kind of think it's creepy to have a gun that might have shot somebody. That's, that's, <laughs> it's just. I don't mind having a history. History. <laughs> It is history. I just I shoot my guns, and I mm-hmm. I when I had my my Springfield, I mean I know the chances are low, but at least there was a potential that when I was going deer hunting, it was with a gun that had done some work in the world, mm-hmm. and. I wouldn't want to do it the other way. It would be weird to me. But whatever. I'm not an old. Um, so Dead Horse saying he taught me that. But, yeah, thanks for taking the opportunity or giving me the opportunity to go back and mention that again because I think it is something that we lack. Uh, we, we take for granted. The Internet isn't given to us. The Internet's a bunch of stuff that people are making money on. We want to sit around like a bunch of punks just, uh, you know, assuming that the Internet was made for us and that it's magic and that, you know, we get offended every time it doesn't work good. It's silly. You know, we don't get offended when our revolver doesn't work good because it should work better, at least if we're capable of understanding machines. Instead, we're going to figure out either we're doing it wrong or we've something has happened. You know, we didn't get it clean enough or something or we're operating it incorrectly. Once we figure that out, we're happier with it and we're effective with it. Same thing with the Internet. So thanks for the opportunity to be able to bring that up. I know the people that are watching this have probably heard it before, but uh, let's see. You wouldn't bring expensive cigars unless you had an elaborate portable humidor. Uh, you would run them, or you would run them with that dry. Well, out here, but even in Oklahoma, it's pretty dry, I think. Uh, let's see. You chase them with the dogs, and you tree them. Oh, you're talking about. Uh, oh, chase the raccoon into a tree. I thought you just waited till they were in a tree, or walked around until you found one, like a squirrel hunt. Like I just thought you waited around until they were up a tree. Uh, two Yugoslavian Mausers. G and G sales is a great place for older guns. Long yeah, time they've yeah. been the place for uh, importing interesting stuff. Um, they're up here in Arizona. Or they're in Arizona, up near um, well, up in Prescott. Uh, but we were talking about Tulsa. I don't know if there's. I mean, I probably didn't do it enough justice. It's a big show, so I don't know if anybody could in one conversation. But what you were chatting with with ghost or gary or somebody the other day and i thought heck if G23, there's somebody yeah oh it was on 20, g23 so g23 yeah. is cool dude who just didn't happen to show up today because he's not all that 2a anymore but back in the day when he was still 2a <laughs> for like for like a year now he's been running a chat every saturday a live conversation that anybody can join here on the youtube and uh you know not on some kind of weird a social platform that hides everything from other, you know, passersby. Instead, he puts it up on YouTube where uh, people can jump in and be part of the conversation. While he doesn't uh, steer the conversation anyway, uh, he'll usually try to bring it around to Second Amendment if it wanders too far. And uh, it's all about guns and pretty uh, fun 
way to spend an afternoon if you're listening to stuff or whatever time of the week you might want to listen to it on replay. But yeah, you guys were chatting in there and something about the way you were describing it. I was like, dang, uh, if I brought anybody in from the old gun channels days, um, most of them either know so many people at the show that, you know, that we'd be talking about either our history or our experiences and relating them to that or potentially talking about the people that they visited with uh, because it's not their first time with the show. You know, we wouldn't get that kind of uh, experience kind of perspective. So I appreciate you uh, being willing to jump in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I'll do is offer anybody who's watching this, if we miss something, if you've been curious about the largest gun show in the United States, which probably makes it the largest gun show in the world, a gun show that's been going on twice a year since probably the 50s, I think. I don't yeah, remember. Bill is the largest gun show in the world. So. I mean, it's possible that some giant city could have a bigger gun show, but they're hiding it, right? Like if they're doing it, no, they're not bragging about it. Mm -hmm. I just. I even assume China could do a bigger gun show because they got more people, but I don't know. Like I said, I really think it is the biggest gun show, certainly the biggest free gun show in the world. Yeah. Um, but again, if some, if we missed something or if we um, overlooked something that you'd be curious about, I'm more than happy to address this again. Uh, I don't want to speak for you, but if you'd be willing, then uh, we'll, I'll have a whole new show about it. Or uh, if people would like to have a show with all the people who did go just to chat about old times and kind of an after action, I encourage it. Uh, you know, this is the internet. You can do things like if it's some kind of produced TV show and the only thing you should do is stuff that attracts more you know, money or more eyeballs and you can only do things that are produced, you know, so it attracts and everything is uh, some sort of a step towards some goal. Or we could use this thing like a big message board place to have conversations and, you know, share uh, what we do. And then passersby, you can see an honest, you know, version of what the internet, what the guns are like on the internet. Um, and that's what I appreciate. So anybody who'd like to have that kind of conversation about uh, the show or their experience at it, let me know. We can uh, schedule it and do that. Um, this was another two hour, one hour show. So thanks to uh, 45 uh, for Charlie for jumping on for an hour and spending two hours. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'm going to pull a John Crump on you and just shut up and let you end the show. But thanks again, anybody who showed up. Uh, there's lots of people that go to the show. Check out um, what hashtag Wanamaker. It's spelled weird. Hey, uh, hashtag, if you for to this year's show, if you do hashtag Tulsa Tulsa Gun Show, is it Tulsa Tulsa Gun Show four two one? I think it is Tulsa Show Tulsa Show four twenty one. So and that will Tulsa be, Show and then four twenty one for yeah, the and that will be this last show. And that's on Instagram, or I don't know. You guys use other platforms too. They may yeah, find them. It's on Instagram. It's on uh, the Facebook thing. Um, but it People was it was a platforms. very enjoyable show. Um, picked up a couple of great rifles. Got to shoot one of them today. Uh, we'll be uh, reviewing that one here in the next couple of weeks. Going over it. Um, now, when we look at this one, Rokal posted this one on like Friday, I think. And is if you're looking at this picture, would you say that this is about as crowded as you've seen it, or was this less or more crowded? It was you? that is less than less crowded than what it was. Okay, okay, good. Because I was gonna say you do not see very many people in this picture. This would be like before it opens, almost. Mm -hmm. Like this is very few people. Okay, so this this was much because if you've never been there before and you were like, oh, this was a lot of people. We'd have different opinions of the. No, you know, you can get actually walk around in there. I mean, if you, okay. these poor guys that were in those uh, um, electric chairs, chairs and, stuff. and stuff, I mean, they were having a hard time getting through the crowds. Okay, that's what it's more like. Normally, yeah. you don't see floor anywhere. Maybe in between the tables, like where the vendors are sitting, you might mm -hmm. see some floor, but normally no floor. Even like the garbage cans, there's like nobody. There's like there's people yeah. walking so close to these things, you don't even see. It was almost we were hating the garbage cans because they were slowing the flow. Yeah, seriously, you'd be walking along, and all of a sudden there's a garbage can in your waist because you had no idea it was coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So that's just uh, he got in there early or something or late, and this picture was well, probably early, but um, this picture just is uh, not the way it was. Good. So, and you can also tell from this picture. Well, this is kind of weird that in this particular area, there'd be an empty table because that's sort of a regulars table. But you can see that there's sometimes the show, even on a normal time, I've seen where it doesn't reach all the way to this wall, where it kind of stops here. And that blue wall there, that's just really tarps and stuff like a fake wall. Right now, there's probably, in, judging from this picture, I'm guessing maybe two car lengths where they could bring a car in like a 
fire truck if they had to, but they don't let people really drive in here. It's just they right. make it so that you could bring a vehicle in here if you had to. Anyway, uh, this looks like the most they'll ever give them, like barely, to, like enough for a fire truck, and that's it. Where mm -hmm. I've been to the show where like maybe 10 rows are this blue thing comes way in here because they just didn't fill the whole show, I guess. Um, but anyway, so this tells us that it was a full show. Like as far as vendors, this was a completely full show, which was something that people weren't sure about. Yeah. Yeah. There was probably um, about 20 foot uh, space between those blue tarps and the outside wall. I guess you can't even tell, but going back to the whole, like, what you put on your head type of situation, I don't see one in this whole picture. So I guess nobody was stressed in Oklahoma. So I'm guessing that means that all you heard about was next month or next show, next show, next show. Everybody was mm -hmm. back on track and next show is coming. Awesome. Yeah. Good. So um, you're planning on going. I'm hoping others will plan on go. It looks like we can all but assume that that's going to be the way it goes. And like I say, I was just throwing out there, if anybody wants to hear more about Tulsa or any of the big gun shows, but Tulsa specifically, we could round up a bunch of people that went this time and have an after action. I guess I kind of wandered off from there, but I think sure. I think that's valuable. I, I, I had an interesting experience the day before the show that uh, somebody actually recognized me. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you're talking about the person who you were in the parking lot? Or no, we were, we were sitting at the table at the restaurant and they were outside waiting to get a table and he recognized me and he's knocking on the window and I look over there and he's got one of my videos playing and he's pointing at it and waving at me. It was just really interesting. It's something I it had never happened to me before. Um, well, that'll happen on the YouTube. So I'd like to start a new thing where if you <laughs> see somebody that you real life, right? You see somebody that you know from YouTube, instead of being weird at them, like take $20 and put it at them. Like $20. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That'd be an interesting, and then they can decide to go. But this starts the show, yeah. But uh, no, that's cool. So I heard you talking about that on there. I assumed it was somebody you were gonna like be eating with, like Gizzard or somebody who was just doing it and be right before they walked. No, I thought you were. I car. actually found out it was just one of my subscribers. Oh, that's super cool. It's creepy, but mm -hmm. uh, it's super cool. Um, he goes, I, I hope I didn't sure. creep you out. I said no. I just it was just unique and one of the high points of the show. Well, it's a way that it's actually a pretty clever way of indicating I know who you are through a window without doing something weird. Like, you know, like you mm -hmm. don't have shirts or something to buy. And like, you know, coincidentally, the guy happens to be wearing your shirt. Like, what's the odds of that? So, right. you know, but it, you are doing some weird hand sign. Like, how's that going to work? So it is a pretty clever way of letting somebody know, hey, I know who you are. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, it's also super creepy. Like, hey, I know who you are. You didn't think it through that, like, and you don't know who I am. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was trying to figure out, okay, who is this? Is this one of the gun streamers or gun tubers that I'm going to meet? Or? But, like, maybe a thumbs up at the end would have been, yeah. like, oh, okay, somebody who's positive as opposed to, like, I'm about to yeah, come Yeah, he was and waving and smiling, smiling and, you know. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I thought it was just, like, you saw the camera and then it was over. Like, no, no, he had a cell phone up showing one of my videos. And right, and I thought it was hey, this just is you, This is you, hey, hey. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. I, I misunderstood when you yeah, said it. It was, it was more creepy. No, it wasn't creepy at all. It was just interesting that, and funny. No, that's super cool then, because then, like you say, cool. now you've got a little bit of, um, well, I don't want to say encouragement, but a little bit of uh, understanding that there are humans on the other side of that computer. Um, mm -hmm. it, I don't remember anymore when I first got that, because I kind of came into it from AOL, understanding that there's people on the other side, but that's, that's a... Anybody can assume anything until you actually experience something like that. That's really neat. And uh, so how long you've been doing the channel? Uh, since 2014. And then how many, I guess let's go look, how many videos you got over here? Oh, I don't even, I lost count. I've a couple hundred, few hundred. And then 13,000 subs? Yeah. Well, you 2 know. million, 3 million views. So I mean, there's only 300 million people in the country. So... 3 million views, you know, that's, that's not insignificant. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm surprised that it actually took you this long. Then if you would have said, I started the channel like two years ago. Okay. That's pretty freaking good. But 14. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I just started off slow and maybe, maybe one, uh, one video a month or one every other month, you know, just as I had time to do it. And I was going to say, did you post something like I'm on my way to Tulsa or anything like that? Uh, yeah. And Instagram, I think I did. Because then it's possible that somebody else is like, 
oh, dang, I'm going to Tulsa too. And now they have it in their head. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, 45 off Charlie's going to be there too. Um, so, uh, or Papa, sorry. That's either way. <laughs> But well, you know what I'm saying? Like now they got it in their head to be on the lookout for you. And mm-hmm. boom, once they got that in their head, they do see you and then they know what to do about it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Because I'm guessing if they were just minding their business and all of a sudden you appeared in front of them, they're not going to necessarily have the wherewithal to just grab their phone, pull your video up, show it at you and all that. Mm-hmm. But um, no, that's pretty neat. And that's, again, part of the community isn't that it's not just all capitalism it isn't just all marketing and people exploiting the social platforms for you know trying to figure out alternative ways to get advertising accomplished um it's basically a continuation of the forums it's a continuation of the gun show whatever it is the gun show 24 7 it is the concept of the people gathering of you know with a similar interest and people gathering with dissimilar interests at the same time to share their or to discover like sample each other's interests i guess and uh, do in an open format so that it's discoverable but then the internet has allowed us to take the conversations that happen there out into the world right and youtube does such a good job of that because you know suggesting videos okay he's watched this how about you check all these guys out and that's it's very unique and interesting how that works because you know you go on some of these other streaming services and there's just not the traffic there but you know you well, can get okay, into, that's into a something like subject. yeah but it's a whole other subject but yeah it's just interesting with youtube that you know they oh, yeah. they put you in front of people that may not have ever seen it well and like you're saying but not quite focused but at least you got more opportunity than ever before to have somebody who's interested in the same kind of stuff uh mm-hmm. to find your stuff where you know, you might find somebody who's into shooting, but oh, they're into revolvers or they're shooting, but they're in it long distance or they're into shooting, but it's different than yours a little bit. And you kind of right. have to settle. But no, they find the people that are into these four things that you're into and not just these four things, but also these four things, like not just, uh, you know, happen to be one thing in common, but all four things in common, I guess. What said. But anyway, uh, that's, again, part of what sharing the community is because the community is more than just uh uh the show and tell and the marketing side it is the whatever you want to call the interactivity the conversations that happen so i've seen you on shows but i don't go i i don't know if i've mentioned this to you specifically but people that watch my channel probably know i don't really go around watching videos on youtube i'll watch live stuff all the time so i've seen you on live shows do you host your own live shows i do not i have not really gotten into that Okay, so then that's even more interesting because if you were like, oh, yeah, I have a live show every Friday or something and I just didn't know about it, then, yeah, it would make sense that somebody would recognize you like that potentially. So that's cool that somebody found you from videos probably more than likely, right? Yeah, just videos. All right, so I did throw the link out there. Thanks, uh, Echo, for mentioning that. I wasn't even paying attention, but... uh, Eventually, we'll wrap it up here. We've tried a couple of times now, but that's what it's all about. Just having a conversation to chat up the show, uh, the concept of the show, and a little bit of details about the show. And we'll put at the end of this whole thing, dot, dot, dot. Uh, I said I was going to, but now I'm actually going to shut up and give it to um, uh, 45 Elf Charlie Papa to end it for us today. Yeah. I, well, thanks for having me on. Um, enjoyed the show. Enjoyed talking about the show. Um if you ever get a chance to get to the Tulsa Arms Show, it is unique. Uh, it is a very unique gun show, and you're going to see a lot of stuff that you may not see otherwise. But uh, other than that, uh, it's been fun, and I know we got to get going.